Good evening, God bless. Welcome back to another edition of the Orthodox Ethos Extended uh, Podcast. Tonight we're going to be looking at a new book that's coming out from Uncut Mountain Press. And it is, a, I think, a publishing event for the Orthodox English-speaking world. We'll have several of those from Uncut Mountain Press coming up. Uh, but tonight we're going to be talking about On the Dogma of the Church by the new martyr, St. Hilarion Trotsky. Thanks for joining us on another edition of Orthodox Ethos Podcast. As you know, We've been working very hard. If you've been following our work, we've been working very hard to produce important patristic literature, especially on the question of the dogma of the church and the uh, contemporary heresy of ecumenism and all of that, which has been uh, is implied today by the various theories on the dogma of the church. And one of the most important figures of the 20th century having to deal from the orthodox patristic perspective, dealing with this question from the very outset of the century is the new martyr, St. Hilarion Trotsky. And so it is imperative for us, if we're going to uh, go deeper and acquire the mind of Christ on this matter and follow the church fathers, meaning the church fathers of our day who've dealt with this matter. If you were in the fourth century and you were faced with the plague of heresy, which was Arianism, you would have taken refuge in the great Cappadocians or St. Athanasius. If you were in the time of the Monothelites, you would have run to St. Maximus. If you were in the time of the false councils, of the false council of Florence, you would have run to St. Mark and on and on. And so we're looking for those towering patristic figures in our day who are going to give us the patristic outlook. And one of those is St. Hilarion Trotsky. St. Hilarion, as you see here on the cover of the book on the Dogma of the Church, which is coming out, as I said, in a few weeks from Anka Mountain Press, has written this, which is essentially a master's thesis on the Dogma of the Church, an historical overview of the sources of ecclesiology. Uh, he wrote this text in his early days as a student, actually. And it is, um, uh, although for a master's, it was essentially a PhD thesis length. In fact, the book, and let me share with you uh, a screenshot from uh, uh, the book page over at Uncut Mountain Press. The master's thesis let me go a little bit to the left here we get there there we go uh is actually over 440 pages <laughs> so it's more like a phd thesis not only is it over 440 pages but it has over 2000 footnotes 2000 references what we have here is not simply a uh, a few thoughts on ecclesiology. What we have here is a tour de force, an historical overview of the sources of the first four centuries, the sources of Orthodox ecclesiology. He goes into the many facets of the of the struggle of the church against the various heresies. We'll talk about that as we go forward. We'll give you snapshots and introductions to aspects of the church of the of the book but what he was doing there was essentially answering what was already going to be the issue of the 20th century from the outset of the 20th century which makes him an exceptionally uh important and for and forward viewing visionary church father and eventually new martyr uh, so this is this is an extremely extensive examination of all the early church fathers and the heresies that they were encountering, and with regard especially to the dogma of the church. We're going to read a little bit tonight from the preface. We're going to show you um, uh, a number of uh, uh, 
snapshots, as I said, from the book. But before we get there, I think it's important to explain a little bit about the saint, about what he's done, what exists already in English, how you can already uh, access a lot of his uh, literature and prepare yourself for this uh, this uh, extensive examination um, and, and understand him uh, in the right context. Because what we have in this text is a early uh, St. Hilarion Trotsky. We have someone who's grappling himself for the, in, in many ways for the first time with all of these sources. And his job in this book and why this book is important is to simply present the sources. So we're not going to have in this book the mature uh, rebuttal of ecumenism or the various theories of ecumenism that we see, for instance, in, and let me share with those uh, some of that material right now. We see, for instance, in his very important text, uh, which you can find online right now, uh, on the unity of the church. Which is over at orthodoxinfo.com. And let me give you, in particular, the title and the uh, link. Here you're going to see about 15, 12, 15 years, 10 years later, I'm not sure exactly when he wrote this. Uh, it says here in 19, um, let's see if it does have the year. I think it's a, it's it's about 1915, 16, sometime in that. The thesis is written a little bit earlier. And so you have him encountering the various theories now that are coming from the West in this, uh, in this extensive epistle that he's writing in response to uh, the, the uh, uh, in particular, in, in response to uh, a American Protestant. Uh, and I don't remember his name. Let's see if it's commemorated here. Uh, a particular representative of the Anglican Church and produced now in English about 45 years ago now. Uh, by Monastery Press. It's been in circulation for quite some time. It's an epistle. And so he goes in and he's basically an, a, doing an apologetic for the um, uh, the Orthodox position. And there you'll see him work forward that which he gives basically in uh, simply reports on and ex and examines and gives uh, a summary of in this, uh, in this text. Uh, so highly recommend anyone who wants to understand the thought of St. Hilarion to go and check out this text, which you can also find uh, uh, in PDF format, which I'll show you as well here. That's what you'll find. This is a PDF of, uh, uh, of, of the, of the text the, that's been produced by the, uh, in Montreal, you know, back in the 70s. Besides that, another text that's very important to understand, the, the, the more mature thought of St. Hilarion is going to be Christianity or the Church, another text produced uh, by uh, the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, uh, similar, but more of a treatise. The other one is an epistle. This is in a treatise. And he's really putting before uh, the Orthodox Church in Russia at the time what is it? Because he was encountering uh, the the very early stages of ecumenism in the form of these student movements that are coming to Russia. If you've read or if you've seen our little book called uh, The Origins of Modern Ecumenism, uh, The Missionary Origins of Modern Ecumenism, in there we have a section dedicated to an encounter and thoughts by St. Hilarion to the new movement, student movement that's coming to Russia by people like John Mott and other evangelical leaders who are going around the world trying to unite the various Protestant sectarians and coming also to the East eventually in the early 19th, 20th century and encountering the Orthodox. <clears throat> and St. Hilarion responds there and in this, uh, in this uh, essay, uh, essentially saying, what is this that they're bringing from the West? What is this? Is this, this is so, something called Christianity but what have we inherited? Have we have we inherited a religion? Have we inherited uh, thousands of denominations that are vying for 
uh, you know, each bringing something to the table. And therefore, if you put this together, you have a mosaic uh, and you've got this shattered uh, image of the church. Now you're supposed to piece back together. And this thing called Christianity that's been developed. Or do you have the church, the body of Christ, which is a given, which is the person of Christ extended, the incarnation extended throughout the ages. And so a very important essay, extremely important. And again, answering very early on all of the various erroneous presuppositions that will, will, will dominate the ecumenical movement and into which we need to stress the Orthodox entered and accepted, into which the Orthodox ent entered and accepted. Uh, so I have to apologize to everyone over who was over at uh, Crowdcast. Uh, we had a some problem, technical problem, and we could not uh, we could not live stream to our Crowdcast platform tonight. So unfortunately, uh, that's not going to be available. Hopefully, everybody gets the uh, the memo from Crowdcast. They come over here to YouTube or to uh, the various other platforms, Facebook, and uh, we're actually doing. We're live streaming tonight also to to uh, LinkedIn, uh, our personal page over LinkedIn. We're also on uh, Orthodox Survival Course on Facebook. We're at Twitter right now. So all of those platforms uh, are uh, live streaming this, uh, this podcast tonight. So Christianity, the Church, another important essay. He goes on, though, and he examines the... Uh, orthodox understanding of Holy Scripture, Holy Scripture and the Church. Very important essay produced and uh, translated and produced by the St. Herman Brotherhood and published in the Orthodox Word a few years ago. Very important uh, if you want to go deeper and understand the Orthodox understanding of the Scripture and the Church and how we should understand it and into which context we should properly understand the Holy Scripture. This essay is tremendous Tremendous uh, assistance. We could, you know, if you're coming from a Protestant background, especially, you're going to be cured of many of your uh, prejudices and, and uh, false uh, uh, presuppositions and understandings uh, of how to approach Holy Scripture. Another, let me actually correct the uh, the link here. That's the link for that. And the previous one, Christianity Church, that's the link for that. But if you go to orthodoxinfo.com, you can find all of this. And this also uh, online uh, PDF, newmartyr.info, St. Hilarion, Holy Scripture, and the Church. Uh, besides that, uh, we also have a very uh, uh, insightful examination of socialism, very timely in our day, from St. Hilarion. And we have uh, been, uh, we have the video produced by Orthodox Wisdom. And the text as well that's circulating from Orthodox uh, Life magazine. Uh, this is a um, uh, available online in, in, to be able to be read in the Orthodox uh, Life magazine. It's basically, um, let's see, where is it? There it is. Nope, that's not it. Let's try again. We want the other one. And there we go. So you can find this online, Christianity and Socialism by the new martyr Hilarion. And this was originally produced by Orthodox Life. And now it's uh, online as a kind of, uh, as a, um, um, all the various old issues in a lot of the articles, very important for our day as well. So St. Hilarion, again, bringing the patristic mind to bear on so such an important topic. Of course, Russia overwhelmed by communism, but we're dealing with socialism and, and Marxism today uh, as well, like, like never before in the Western world, so very pertinent. I want to also make you uh, aware of a, uh, you can find this by just searching online, but just to bring to your attention, a um, beautiful essay, The Relevance of the Holy Higher Martyr Hilarion Trotsky for our times, the relevance for our times. I think that uh, this would be a good read if you want to say, well, what did, why do I have to read? What's the what's important? Why is St. Hilarion important for the church today? Well, here's a wonderful essay uh, that's going to uh, uh, be very illuminating. And you can also see on the right, there's other, other uh, uh, texts that uh, they have available at ortho 
Christian.com on the persecution against the Russian Orthodox Church and Archbishop Hilarion Trotsky, Metropolitan Anthony Kravovitsky, a man of pastoral joy, uh, and, and many other uh, texts that you can find. Why is it necessary to restore the patriarchy? It also by St. Hilarion. By the way, all of these texts, our goal at, or at Uncommon Mountain Press is to bring the whole corpus, the entire writings of St. Hilarion into English. Uh, year after year, we hope once a year we'll bring out a tome like this one, the 440 pages, uh, and it will be circulating uh, each year a new uh, offering from St. Hilarion because he is so relevant and his writings are so relevant and so important. And because he is, I think, and, and what I'll talk about a, a lot tonight is his place in the conveying of the holy tradition is very unique and very important <clears throat> because he is not... Uh, he, he, he truly is a universal Orthodox saint, and he brings to bear the universal tradition in many ways, uh, not without some limitations. And we'll talk about those as well, because everyone has their limitations and historical and otherwise. So we'll talk about that as well. But a very important essay there on the relevance of St. Hilarion. And then <clears throat> uh, a very a very good and important resource online is uh classical Christianity. Uh, if you've not been over to that uh, website, Classical Christianity, um, done by a very good uh, friend of ours uh, who produces wonderful material, a lot of excerpts, and very astute himself in observations. But you can see here, he's got a lot of excerpts uh, from the writings of St. Laurian on the church and the canon of scripture, like we said before, the effects of separation from the church. Wonderful little uh, excerpts how, on how to debate the iconophobes, on the reduction of Christianity. These are excerpts from various essays. Some of them we've already talked about tonight, but deification, evolution. You can see he has he has so many important things to say to all of us today. We need to take refuge in the saints. And so if you're not an avid reader of the writings of St. Laurian, here's your opportunity. Now let's go back to the book. Let's read a little bit about the book. And let me share uh, the excerpt that's online at our uh, website uh, and talk about that a, a bit. So we have, uh, let me just read it and then we'll talk about it. The question of the identity of the church, its membership, hierarchy, and mysteries is of paramount importance today and also the primary stumbling block within heterodoxy and the ecumenical movement, including some unfortunate Orthodox who have uh, succumbed to uh, the various uh, uh, deluded ideas about the church, embraced uh, those and uh, promoted them within the Orthodox church. Uh, in this book on the dogma of the church, an historical overview of the sources of ecclesiology, the holy higher martyr, Hilarion, St. Hilarion Trotsky explores patristic resources from early centuries of Christianity, seminal works at the periphery of the consciences of every Christian, and brings them to the forefront as living witnesses to the unbroken tradition of the church. So again, the goal here in this book, as you'll see when we go into each chapter, is not to immediately defend the faith against contemporary heretical views. It's not an apology uh, as those other essays that we've shown you uh, for our stance in terms of ecumenism or the reception of converts, the proper orthodox reception, understanding of the reception of converts, which is also addressed by St. Hilarion in the, on the unity of the church. Uh, it's not, this is not what this book is. This book is to take you back to the scriptures and to the early church fathers and what they encountered and, and what they understood the church to be. So it's, it's 2,400 references uh, to the church fathers and the various heretical uh, ideas uh, that were circulating, including the contemporary scholarship in Russia at the time when he was writing this in the early 20th century. Uh, St. Hilarion's staggeringly extensive familiarity with sources, both patristic and modern, coupled with his own lucid thinking and profoundly orthodox outlook, superbly equip him for his extensive analysis of the subject, eminently engaging and highly readable this collection of essays, this collection of essays 
takes the reader on a journey through an exploration of the dogma of the church in the experience of her members. Remember that orthodox theology is, is uh, or dogmatic theology is experience. It's based on experience. It's not a theoretical, speculative, philosophical approach. It's not, uh, again, a armchair academic theology in the Orthodox Church. It's the experience of the life in Christ then put down in uh, a, a expressing the mind of Christ. That's what we're talking about. That's what he's examining. And that's why, and he, as one who then repeats and goes deeper and can speak from experience in his day and counter the various theories, he's one who can guide us and show us and present to us uh, these uh, uh, this experience uh, as expressed in the ancient fathers. Uh, St. Hilarion presents the reader with historical affirmations of present-day church life and worship, touching on subjects ranging from hierarchical roles to biblical mistranslation. So he's not dealing just with the, uh, a narrow aspect of church dogma, but he's looking, at, he's looking at all the different things that they were encountering, because there were a variety of ideas and heretical movements, as you'll see, that, he, that, that were addressed from the very beginning. One of the delusions today is that, oh, we didn't really have any ecclesiological development. We don't really know what the church, nobody really talked about the church. That's just not right. That's not true. As you'll see in this may, amazing text, from the get-go, people were talking about the church and the heresies of the days were, uh, were against the, 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 the experience and the life and the dogma, therefore, of the church. Uh, and that's what's you, both, uh, uh, that's what's common with the heresies of today. We th tend to think that the heresies of the day are very drastically different than the early church heresies. That's, not, that's actually not the case. We have a lot of similarity in the rejection of the life and experience and the authority of the church in every age and in every heresy, including the very the various papal Protestant and uh, papal and reformed Protestant uh, sectarian ideas about the church. In the words of the foreword to the 2004 Russian edition, in his works, Hiramater Hilarion expounds the Catholic truth of the church, and does so naturally and organically for his whole life melded entirely with the life of the church. This is why, when discussing things well-known and generally accepted, Father Hilarion, St. Hilarion, was able to present them in his own way and in a new light. That's exactly how it should be. This superb collection of essays is one that will edify the minds and enrich the ecclesiastical lives of new generations of Christians of all walks of life while providing invaluable context for evaluating the authenticity and orthodoxy of contemporary theories about the church. So why is that? That's extremely important for every one of us. It, it, we cannot rely on the experts in the church, meaning the academic theologians or the even the uh, those who are pushing various theories among the hierarchy. And they want us to just blindly follow them into the delusion of ecumenism. So we are not going to say, not, we have no apology on the, at the second coming at the ju judgment seat and say, well, it's his fault. It's the, it's the, dec the academic theologian's fault. It's the, those bishops who follow those academic theologians. It's their fault that I ended up where I am today, outside of the, of the church, among the, the weeds of heresy, not living a strict ascetic life, not li living in the communion of the church, which is where ecumenism leads the people. And they, and they block those who want that life from coming and entering in. And so uh, we cannot blame anyone else. We, as The minute you have been baptized, you've been chrismated, you've communed to the mysteries, you have a grave responsibility to bear the burden of being an Orthodox Christian and confessing the faith. That means you know the faith. That means you've learned the faith. You've gone deeper. So all of us are required to that for our own salvation, but how much more for the sake of the brethren? The sake of those who've been deluded, who've been led astray, those who are under the attack of the various demonic ideas about the church, those various theories that are undermining the unity of the church today. It is not someone else's job. It's not someone else's responsibility to bear that burden and therefore fulfill the law of Christ. If we love Christ and the brethren, we will go deeper in the understanding, experiential, and through the experience of the saints uh, of the church, 
of the body of Christ, of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to live in the church, what the boundaries are, what the nature is, what the identity is. That's something we each individually have a responsibility and a, and a need spiritually to acquire. So that's why this book is invaluable. You're going to go through the, those first four centuries and you're going to look at what the church fathers had to say. So if you're a, 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 among those outside the body of Christ, among the various papal and reformed Protestant sectarians, and you're looking for the truth in orthodoxy, here is a book which will be very ex helpful to, to see from the beginning what the church church's mind in the church fathers is about the nature and the identity of the church. Let me just say, let me take a break and say, we're extremely grateful and we're extremely pleased uh, that we were able to come together and work with Father Nathan Williams, a tremendous, uh, uh, tremendously professional and, and studious and serious translator from Russian. Uh, he's translated a number of texts and important texts already, but this, I think, uh, is one of the most important, uh, in, at least in our estimation, why we spent a lot of time and a lot of resources to make this available to you in the English-speaking world. We're very grateful to Father Nathan for his struggle. Uh, without him, it could not be possible. And as you'll see, it's very readable. It's very readable. It's very uh, approachable. All right, so that is uh, a, a few words on the importance of the text. Let me open up and... Uh, um, also, uh, before we go into the chapters and uh, and look at, uh, at the, the inner part of the text, let me say a little bit about the person of St. Hilarion and why he's so, so important in terms of, uh, in terms of church history. Uh, well, in terms of these questions that we're facing today in the Orthodox Church. We have to go back before his time. We have to go back into the 18th century. We have to go back to what was going on in, uh, in the 18th century around the Orthodox world. And then we're going to understand the, the pivotal role that he plays in being a bridge to the early church, earlier church fathers uh, for us who are after him in the 21st century. Uh, not unlike Saint, uh, in a different way, of course, Saint uh, Paisus Velichkovsky or St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain. Uh, St. Hilarion is a key living link. He's a key link to the holy tradition and to the uh, continuation of that coming down to us to this day. He's a key because he actually, of course, read Greek and read Latin, as you'll see in this, in this extensive, uh, his extensive notes. Uh, he's citing a Greek and Latin texts throughout. So uh, a man very well educated, but also extremely well, as we said, well uh, versed and enmeshed in the life of the church. Uh, so he takes all those tools and he goes back and he and he has access to the writings of those who came before him. And it's obvious to me, at least, that this is something that I, I can't, uh, you know, confirm from other uh, sources. But I think he must have been uh, very familiar with St. Nicodemus, the Pedalian, and the writings uh, of the of the 18th and 19th century church fathers from Greece. And of course, he would have been connected with St. Paisius Velichkovsky and the great renewal of orthodoxy coming through St. Paisius to the Optinum Fathers, to Valam, and the whole Philokalia renaissance of the 19th century in great saints like St. Seraphim of Serov or St. Ambrose of Optina or any number of St. Ignatius Branchet all of these great church fathers that we now are reading that has been translated into English, thank God, by people like Father Nicholas Kotar up at uh, Jordanville and others who are translating St. Ignatius Branchet is translating St. The Theophon the Reckless uh, from St. Herman of Alaska Brotherhood. These church fathers are, are, are part of this Paisian Renaissance that came to Russia. And in, in, in many ways are of the same mind and the same spirit and the same ethos and outlook as the Kolivadi's fathers. And that's why I uh, tend to think of St. Hilarion as a, uh, of course, not strictly speaking, but in spirit, a Kolivadi's father in Russia. Uh, because he's taking the baton, as it were, and passing it on uh, to the Russian church. It's not an accident that he... Uh, was very close to Metropolitan Anthony Krapovitsky, the first chief hierarch, first hierarch of the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, which has been the, uh, the vessel 
in many ways uh, in the Western world of, of bringing and connecting us and, and communicating to us the, the authentic, orthodox, ascetic ethos uh, that has come, come to the church in the Western world. Much of that has been through the witnesses of those great towering figures coming out of Russia uh, in the 1920s and 30s, Metropolitan Anthony, St. John of Shanghai in San Francisco, uh, Father, Father uh, Michael Povazansky, and others who wrote and lived and communicated to the Russian diaspora and then to the English-speaking people around the world through translations, uh, as we said, citing from uh, some of St. Hilarion's translations. The fact that he was close to Metropolitan Anthony, it was at the was that in many ways the, the the foundation of the Russian church outside of Russia and the new martyrs, himself a new martyr uh, and uh, dying uh, after uh, contracting sickness when he was in prison in Solovki in 1929. A defender of the Patriarchate, a defender of St. Tikhon, a confessor of the faith. Uh, he, uh, you know, in so many ways played a very important and pivotal role uh, role in connecting the church in Russia, all of these great new martyrs, uh, through his work and his writings, he was re revered and respected for, for that offering by so many of the new martyrs. Uh, and so St. Hilarion, in many ways, I would call him a Kolivadi's father in Russia. And he connects, therefore, in that way, uh, or Russian orthodoxy and uh, orthodoxy in the uh, uh, Constantinople and in Greece and in the Mediterranean. It connects through his writings and his uh, his patristic witness. Uh, you see and feel the same spirit that you find in St. Paisus and St. Nicodemus. Now, if we go back and spend just a moment or two talking about the battle that was going on in the 18th century of the Orthodox Church against all of this encrosion from the West already going on, throughout the whole uh, of the 18th century, the 1700s, even into the 17th century, the end of the 17th century, you see the beginning of the, the turning away from patristic orthodoxy among uh, those influenced by the West, among the hierarchies, some academic theologians. Uh, you see that both in Greece and in Russia. You know, it, it's good to remember St. Paisios, who we commemorate and we revere today, uh, he walked away from this as a young man when he went to theological school in Ukraine. He turned his back on Latinization, the Western captivity of his day, and the theological captivity of the theological schools of the time, which were teaching even in Latin in, in certain parts of the West, Western uh, Ukraine and other places. So much so had they, had they lost touch with the holy tradition that they were teaching in Latin and, of course, communicating a scholastic, Latinized understanding uh, of, of the church fathers and church experience. So he walked away from that. And where did he go? To Mount Athos. He went, he went to the same sources, the same life of St. Nicodemus and the Colivadi's fathers. And, of course, he was at one with them. And one of the key figures that, that tells us and shows us that he was one with St. Nicodemus, uh, besides the fact that St. Nicodemus early on, the great, St. Nicodemus early on actually got in a boat and tried to go and become the disciple of St. Paisios, uh, but it was not God's will. And uh, he turned back, he realized that it was not God's will. He stayed on the holy mountain. But so they were so much connected. Uh, you can see that in the lives of the two saints, but also in, in historical events like this, but also in the fact that they were both very close to uh, uh, Dorotheos Volisma, who is uh, who was a uh, teacher and preacher of the cons of the patriarchate and worked closely with Saint Nicodemus on the Pedalion. and and contrary to the deluded ideas of some contemporary academics that they were not of one mind, it's very obvious that they were of one mind when you consider besides the fact that we have all of the uh, correspondence, but if you consider the fact that Saint uh, Paisios asked for and received the treaties of, of Vulesmas, uh, the Orthodox Vulesmas, on the whole question of the day, which is still the question of the day, and the question of reception of converts, reception of the heterodox, uh, and the question of baptism, should the Latins, should the papal Protestants be received by baptism into the Orthodox Church? That was the, a major issue 
in the seventh in the 18th century of course we have the council in 1755 in which the uh, patriarchates uh and the patriarchs of the day said yes they must be received by baptism you have the medallion in which saint nicodemus says the same thing you have the trees by vula's mas that says the same thing and paisos saint paisos asking and receiving that from him his his spiritual son essentially saint vula's mas was planning to be himself also a disciple of Paisos Velaskovsky and had plans to go and become a monk in the monastery, wanted to do that in much, for much of his life, but it was not blessed. He served the church very valiantly in the patriarchate, but he got that text, translated it, and published it just before his repose uh, in the early uh, 19th century. Uh, why am I talking about all that? Because these events are what formed or what was going on and what the church was struggling with, and also what made it, made it played a big role in forming also the mature thoughts of St. Hilarion Trotsky, because he's reading these writings, he's reading the, his predecessors, he's, he's, he's receiving and following his immediate predecessors and those before him, like St. Paisios. And you can, you can see clearly that he wants to be a... Uh, follower of the Holy Fathers, Epomenes Tisagias Patrasi. This is the key uh, characteristic of the saint, that he is a disciple of the disciples, that he is an obedient uh, uh, one, one uh, to Christ in the saints. And of course, you can't be obedient to Christ if not in the church and if not in the saints. You cannot, on your own, uh, be a true disciple of the master without being a disciple of of the disciples of the master. These things are inseparable. That's the that's the nature of the church, that it is uh, at one and the same time Catholic, meaning the whole truth, and apostolic, and one and holy, meaning that Christ is, uh, it's Christ all in all. All of these things are simultaneous. We didn't say, we don't confess faith in, by the way, faith in, not we're not talking about, but we're confessing faith in the church, meaning the body of Christ, the church, therefore, is a person that we're confessing faith in, that's Christ himself. And we're not confessing it and saying, well, we believe in the church or the apostolic church or the Catholic church or the one church or the holy church. Those things are not what we confess. All together, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, right? All together, all these are, these are all necessary and it's all it's all uh, it's necessary if you're going to be a disciple of Christ to be a disciple of the apostles and the successors of the apostles. And so you see, Saint Hilarion is a one who is a pomenis disagies patrasi, following the holy fathers. And this is why it's so invaluable in our day because following the holy fathers, he's now encountering the beginning of this massive grave challenge to the church in the 20th, 20th and 21st century, which is the heresy, the pan heresy as St. Eusti uh, Bobovich calls it, of ecumenism. This pan-heresy of ecumenism, which is a threat to the very uh, salvation of all the members of the body. You, you ask, well, you know, we, you, many of you are struggling in your parishes and other places because you're struggling not only with your passions, your sins, the world, the devil, and all the rest, but you're also struggling, unfortunately, with, in many ways, a clergy who are not fully immersed and fully committed to the holy tradition. They've been infected, they've been deluded, they've been pulled away uh, by various ideas. And, and whether you know it or understand it or not, a lot of that secularization, a lot of that distortion that you feel or that you're resisting in various places today in the, in the Orthodox world, during the COVIDism and all the rest, it has to do directly with this pan-heresy. That for decades and decades, We've, the church has been weakened, the people of God have been weakened in the church by this heresy, this pernicious, deluded idea that the church is not one, not holy, not Catholic, not apostolic, not apostolic but it's united to heterodoxy. It's got falsehood and truth within it. It is divided. All these various uh, uh, theories imply these cacodoxies about Christ, the body of Christ. These things going on for decades now and eating away at the strength and the prophetic voice of the church obviously plays a huge role in the very life that you and I lead in the parishes and, and how much, uh, what a dynamic or lack of dynamic life we have in the parish. It's all connected. So 
the fact that, as we said earlier, you cannot be indifferent. You are a co-responsible. All of us are co-responsible for the life of the church. That's why coming to the feet of the great saints who, who passed on to us the holy tradition, like St. Hilarion, is essential. If you're going to make progress, you're going to be a part of the solution. You're going to be a healthy cell in the, in the body. You're going to be uh, yourself a follower of the Holy Fathers. All right, let's turn now to, we'll come back. There's much more we can say, actually, a lot of history, a lot of interesting. Let's turn now to uh, the book. We'll talk a little bit about uh, just aspects of the book. Right there, you see uh, the title page, St. Hilarion. And the scroll that he has in his hands right there is, without the church, there is no salvation. Without the church, there is no salvation. That reminds us of the famous saying by St. Cyprian, Cyprian of Carthage, there is no salvation outside the church. And it's, um, let me see if we can, yeah. It is not an accident um, that St. Hilarion has that scroll, of course. He is a faithful follower of uh, St. Cyprian, presents St. Cyprian's views, embraces them in all of his essays, understands the importance of St. Cyprian. He does not turn away from him. Of course, St. Cyprian, like all the church fathers, uh, cannot stand alone. We will embrace the consensus. We can embrace the patristic consensus and not one or two fathers. And that's why immediately when you hear someone tearing down St. Cyprian, you know that they actually do not have a patristic view of things because the fathers neither would never tear down a church father, first of all. Secondly, they would not put all their marbles in one basket and say, this is it. He alone, St. Augustine alone, St. Cyprian alone. No, that's not the patristic way. Uh, but they would not disregard them at all as because the saints did not dis disregard those coming before them, including St. Cyprian. So without the church, there is no salvation, he says here. There is no church salvation outside the church, St. Cyprian says. And all that is saying, brothers and sisters, is there's no salvation outside of Christ because Christ is the church. And this is another effect. This is another uh, 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 terrible fruit of the contemporary Protestant outlook on the church is that we, some Orthodox, unfortunately, but in the world you see this going on, they're implicitly separating the church from Christ. And they're talking about one who can be separated from church but united to Christ. But that's impossible because Christ is the church. Christ is the body of Christ, obviously. He's the head. And that's why when you say there's no salvation outside the church, all you're saying is the church is Christ because there's no salvation outside of Christ. Unless you want to embrace the various theories of ecumenism and perennialism and universalism and all the rest, which are dissolving the last death nail, the last nail in the coffin of the heterodox West is coming with universalism, perennialism, and the whole march to Antichrist, which is going to talk about unity of all religions. And many pass up the mountains. We see and hear even some Orthodox uh, her, uh, uh, hierarchs who are not Orthodox at all, uh, mentioning and saying, following blindly the blind of the world. Uh, so if you in your mind, separate and talk about the church over here and Christ over there, know that you are not following the Holy Fathers. Now you're going to say, well, what about those outside the church? Well, that's another question, but it's not an ecclesiological question. It's not, in other words, it's not, it's not, uh, it, you cannot talk about salvation and life in Christ outside of life in the church. These are one and the same thing. So what is experienced out there, we can talk about that, but it's not really the topic tonight, is a preparation for, a response to, a preparation for the church, life in the church, and a response by the Holy Spirit to the longings of every human being, the, the desires of every human being to be in communion with God. And that definitely is the work of the Holy Spirit to bring every human being to the light and to the church. And that work of the Holy Spirit outside the church we can talk about, it, but it's not the same work. It's not the same energy. The in an energy to you, the energy of God in the church, in the in the mysteries, the purification, illumination, and glorification or deification of man 
is not that which was happening outside the presuppositions, outside the body, outside the communion and the union, outside of the initiation into the mystery. That's a work of the Holy Spirit, which is not that of deification, purification, and the mysteries and all the rest. So we have to make a very clear and different work and different presuppositions exist for those two things. So when does the church start? When do the, where are the boundaries set for the church? Well, when we the mysteries begin, when we become uh, initiated into the mystery, and when we are received by the church as a catechumen, we begin the process of preparation for that initiation and that union. And that's a very clear, concrete, historical, practical reality. You know, it's a scandal to the mind of the Gnostic today that Christ is here and not there, that you have to be initiated into him in a time and place. That's the great scandal that the modern Gnostic mind will not easily accept. They want it to be nebulous. They want it to be spiritual. They want it to be malleable because they want to retain their own will and desire and ideas and not submit. But as we said, the characteristic of the Christian is to submit to Christ in the church through the Fa Holy Fathers, following the Holy Fathers' teachings. Let's look at the table of contents and a little bit what uh, you have in this book. Uh, beyond the foreword and, and the about the author, we have the preface, which we're going to read from tonight a bit. And then we go through the various uh, chapters. And we have six essays, six uh, essential, uh, essentially presenting and some commentary. Again, I want to stress this book is not an extensive commentary by St. Hilarion on the various theories of ecumenism. One should not buy this book if that's what they're looking for. They have those uh, available to them in part in some of the essays that I've mentioned earlier in the podcast. No, what you're going to do here in this book is you're going to go to the sources and St. Hilarion is going to guide you through those sources step by step. He's not going to do a lot of the commentary that you might want, some, but not a tremendous amount. He's going to say, here's what St. Augustine said. Here's what St. Cyprian said. Here's what uh, the various uh, saints said. So in the first essay, let's see, did I get this? This is the first essay. The first essay is the New Testament doctrine concerning the church. Uh, and you see here automatically St. Hilarion is saying, look, what I'm doing here is not a complete treatment. He does this again and again. He's doing essentially a master's thesis here. So he's saying to his professors, to his uh, reviewers, who loved this text, by the way, as you read in the, uh, uh, the, in the uh, uh, introduction the, about St. Hilarion, you'll see that they adored this text. They saw it as a, I mean, this is a young man who's, who's going thoroughly through the church fathers reading the original sources and so they're thrilled and they really uh, immediately promote uh, the text and saint hilarion uh very quickly up the the, the ranks of uh, uh uh of church hierarchy and give him a lot of responsibility he almost teaches immediately after his graduation uh but here he's saying look in this the subject of which is the history of the dogma concerning the church we naturally can provide only a very general outline of the doctrine of the new testament which, having no independent and absolute scholarly value, can only serve as a kind of introduction to the history of dogma proper concerning the church. So he's humbly saying, look, I can only do so much in this essay. Uh, and for all of those out there, you know, people writing me and say, are you, are, have you started? Uh, unfortunately, they're not getting the message that we are not working on. Let me just write them here. Uh, we're not working uh, through Crowdcast tonight. Unfortunately, we had a we had a problem. Uh, so, New Testament doctrine concerning the church is essay one, examines the scriptural passages and the commentary of the fathers on that. Number two, second essay, the concept of the church in anti-Judean polemics of the first two centuries. So you have the Judaizers. Many people don't realize that St. Paul, fighting against the Judaizers, talking about that in his epistles very clearly, this is a question of ecclesiology. This is a question of the church, the boundary of the church, the submission of the church. And it's important to remember that uh, 
contrary to contemporary ideas, uh, that we can have massive uh, uh, and important differences, but still be a part of the same church and, and have the same life in Christ, even though we're separated and we don't have communion and all the rest. These are the theories of ecumenism. Contrary to that, you see the what with what sensitivity, uh, with what uh, uh, care, Saint Paul and the and the early uh, the early apostles counter the Judaizers and say that. Even that comparatively simple and, and non-confrontational stance in some ways of the Judaizers, this is another gospel. It's another gospel, St. Paul says. Uh, the fact that they would, they would not see the fulfillment of circumcision and baptism. They wanted to impose upon the Gentiles the various types that have now been fulfilled implies and shows that they had not embraced Christ as the Messiah fully. They had not understand, understood the fulfillment, the completion uh, uh, of, of all the preparation of the Old Testament. They were still holding on and not submitting again and again and again throughout church history. What we have is a failure and a refusal to submit to Christ as all in all, as, a, as the fulfillment of, and the fullness, and there is no lacking. There's no partiality. There's no partial communion, partial participation, partial acceptance. You either submit and are and 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 are die to the old man and rise again now in Christ and accept everything that He gives, or you are not His disciple. It's that simple. And so the Judaizers would not, and they were teaching and preaching another gospel, of course. That has to do with ecclesiology. So here we have, in the first two centuries, already a tremendous amount of resources for us to understand the boundaries of the church. And we're grateful very much to St. Hilarion, who's going to guide us through that. Chapter 3, third essay. And these are extensive essays. We're talking about 440 pages uh, in, in, these, uh, in these essays. In the third essay, we have the teaching of the anti-Gnostic writers concerning the church. Uh, one second, let me just give a heads up to everybody who's, who's still, uh, if they're still over there, I hope they're not still over there, but some people might be popping in over there and not realizing that they need to go over to YouTube. Uh, teaching of the anti-Nastic writers concerning the church. So he's examining all those early church fathers, St. Irenaeus and others who stood against the Gnostics of the day. And of course, the Gnostics are alive and well today. As you, If you've been following our, uh, our series of lectures on the book of Revelation, you'll see that Freemasonry and the various secret societies, the New Age, and all of that is a total revival of Gnosticism. That there's a whole Gnostic element to the Protestant sectarians today. The denial of the real the denial of the reality of Christ in the mysteries, uh, the wanting to make everything uh, essentially uh, a denial of the body, the denial of the body. I mean, ecumenism is a kind of Gnosticism. It denies the, the, the scandal of the particular, the scandal that is that the body is in a particular place and time and an identity, and you have to enter into that. That's a kind of Gnostic rejection of the body, right, of, of, of reality, in, and and not and wanting to spiritualize everything, uh, and and empty it, empty it, and, and empty the incarnation of its of the implications of the incarnation. They want to they want to walk away from that narrowness, right? That that's too narrow for us. Uh, we want a Christ that's going to be very malleable in our hands, and we can become perennialists easily, and we can we can reshape things to make them in our minds make sense. Okay, that's the modern humanist mentality that is dominating most religious men and women today and most seekers. And so this is the antidote. St. Hilarion is going to come here and tell you how to uh, see this through the lens of early church fathers. We also have fourth essay, the doctrine of the sanctity of the church and the conflict with Montanism. Again, if you've been watching our lectures on uh, the book of Revelation, you'll be familiar with that harlot, uh, that Jezebel, right, uh, that was a great uh, threat to the church uh, in, in, in Asia Minor, who was a predecessor of the Montanists. And 
remained within the body was not not uh, decisively excised. And that was the great complaint of the Lord with the bishop that he did not decisively excise this heretical minded uh, Jezebel. And the church eventually from that uh, area of Asia Minor became the source of the heresy of Montanism. So the church was, was struggling from, its, from the get-go with heresies that undermined the nature of the church, whether it be the one the oneness of the church, and that would be the oneness of baptism, by the way. The oneness of the church and the oneness of baptism are inseparable. Because you're baptized into the church, and there's only one way, one door into that church, and that's through death and resurrection. That's the door to the church. Therefore, the one baptism, the one faith, the one church, those things are inseparable. St. Paul commemorates them all together. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. So that sanctity is another aspect that was under attack in the early church by the various heretics, including the Montanists, and the distortion of what it means to be holy and all the rest. Uh, and so in this fourth essay, we have a 200 force here by St. Hilarion, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of citations, not only modern, but also not only ancient, but also modern. Question of the church in the dogmatics, dogmatic polemics. Uh, I'm sorry, no, we're going to the fifth essay. Fifth essay is the teaching of St. Cyprian of Carthage concerning the church. It takes a whole chapter and dedicates it to St. Cyprian uh, and, uh, and then follows up uh, with uh, an examination of the church's polemics with Donatism. And of course, that's going to be dominated to a large degree by St. Augustine. So both of these towering African church fathers, St. Cyprian and St. Augustine, are dealt with in this book, uh, oftentimes uh, the debate today centers around uh, these two figures and the third century, uh, uh, the third century struggle with the various heresies and what the church fathers had to say about that. And uh, uh, so I think this 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 book is going to be very valuable to all of our researchers, all of our theologians, all of the people who want to go deeper and and see through a proper lens a church father of our day, the church fathers in the ancient. Uh, world. So let's go. Uh, we're already one hour in, so I don't want to go too long tonight. But I'm just going to be touching on uh, the book, but let's go to uh, the actual book. Let me open up the PDF here. And we'll walk it through a little bit. So this is the actual PDF, which is on its way to the printer. Let me uh, open it up here. Uh, so we have a little part about the author, a short, short piece about the author. Let me actually go back and just show you. We have some of the pages here. I think it'll be interesting for you. Just, just... So we begin here, and we've got the publisher page and the contents, the foreword here. Just a little commemoration about the English edition, about the author, a few words about the author. Uh, let me actually read on the left side here a few words that his uh, contemporaries said about him in this, in this particular essay. In his review, S.S. Glakolev, I'm probably saying it wrong, in particular stated books such as that of Mr. Trotsky. Now, he was a layman at the time, right? He was not, apparently he was, I think he was ordained shortly after this. Mr. Trotsky rarely appeared uh, appear in Rus in Rus. It, it, its advent marks a red letter day for theological scholarship. Professor Muratov noted that the work of Trotsky not only supplements but wholly surpasses the works of uh, his Russian predecessors, and concluded his review with the words of high praise. If it were up to me, without the slightest hesitation, I would declare Trotsky's dissertation fully worthy, not only of a master's degree, but a PhD. Not only a master's degree, but a PhD. As I said, the length of this is uh, is very, uh, very much a PhD length essay. It's not a master's. I don't think anybody is going to write 400 uh, pages and 2,400 footnotes today for their master's degree, more like 120 or something or 200 at the most. 
Uh, and so the professor is recognizing this, this amazing offering of this, uh, this master student. Um, you know, it's important to, to, to show this because there are going to be people today in some of our seminaries who are going to dismiss this book as, uh, you know, just uh, uh, hardcore traditionalism or something like that. They'll use some kind of phrase to pigeonhole it in a kind of in a snotty way. Uh, but that's not how his contemporaries understood it. And that's not how the saints uh, viewed it. And, and people like uh, the towering figure of Metropolitan Anthony and all those who followed him. Uh, so uh, we should not uh, listen to uh, some of our academic uh, elites here who uh, don't want to deal with such a formidable opponent uh, when it comes to uh, the questions that are facing the church today. You know, they want, they want to be able to dominate the discussion, and that's why they shut out certain voices uh, that should be front and center. And St. Hilarion, sometimes I, I get the sense that he is uh, not given his due today. And hopefully this book will be uh, the beginning of a reversal of that. So his defense took place on December 11th, 1912. That's what I was looking for earlier. Uh, and it was in the form of a debate on, on, in 1913. He was awarded his degree and he was received the Macarius Award in March of the same year. All right, so let's read a little bit the preface, and then we'll open it up for questions and a discussion. The dogma concerning the church may be termed the self-identification of the church. It is this dogma that determines... Let me actually let's maybe get a little bit higher, and that way we can see the text better. There we go. It is this dogma that determines what the church is and what dis distinguishes it from all that is not the church. The church is not a phenomenon of the earth, a natural earthly order. The mysterious depths of church life in accordance with the unfailing promise of Christ the Savior are always and invariably enveloped by the grace-filled power of the Holy Spirit. The full depth of this mystical life of the church is not, of course, subject to logical definitions and scholarly research. Okay, so right off the bat, he's saying, look, I'm doing this research, but do not be deluded to think that we're going we're gonna to cover, cover it all. This is going to be a partial covering to a certain degree uh, because you have to live the life to understand it. You have to live it, to, to and you, even then you won't be able to express it. Even then you won't be able to express it fully. It is given directly to him who participates in it, as Hilary of Portier expressed in the words, this is the peculiar property of the church, that when she makes herself known, then she is understood. I'm reading from the translation in the footnote. And this is an interesting quote because it's a little obscure, I think, for most of us. What is he talking about? The peculiar property of the church is that when she makes herself known, then she is understood. Well, if we remember the famous saying of St. Nicholas Gavasilas, that the church is known in the mysteries. The church is known in the mysteries. Because what, what are the mysteries? But Christ given and himself giving himself and being given, right? He is the one who is both giving the mystery, imparting it, and is given in the mystery. Whether it be the Eucharist or baptism or ordination, he is doing all. He is all in all in every mystery. And so therefore, it should be obvious immediately that he's not going to deny himself. He's not going to be schizophrenic. He's not going to uh, give there where the rest of his body does not exist. Now, if we understand the mysteries immediately, we just reject as absurd and obscene the various theories of partial communion and partial churchliness and and all of these various theories that want because there's other motivations and other perspectives coming that are not purely based on the experience of the church so the church is known in the mysteries and he's saying that you can't understand the church until she makes herself known when in the mysteries in other words participation that's what that means 
You have to participate in the church to understand. And that's when it's, it's understood is when it's known and it's known in the mysteries. So for this reason, we may say that the self-identification of the church is experienced specifically by one who dwells in the church and is a living member of her body. All right. So if you're not in it, you're only going to get it piecemeal. You're only going to stand piecemeal. You're going to, there's going to be a, it's going to be a closed book. And that's exactly what Tertullian said to the heretics, the great father of African Christianity and the, the master, as St. Cyprian called him. This was, of course, before he fell at the end of his life into the heresy, uh, but he was still revered um, for all of that he offered. And he said famously that uh, the scriptures do not belong to the heretics, to the heterodox, to the sectarians. It is a closed book because it presupposes, of course, the life of the church. Uh, it's not does not belong to them. And this, of course, this is the truth of the gospel, the truth of the dogma of the church, right? Which is a mystery, which is the which is the mystery of the incarnation, is a closed book to those who have no experience of the church. That's why. It's absurd to, to accept and believe that in a movement such as ecumenism, we're going to reach a point where we all have the same understanding and expression and experience of the church because it presupposes experience and participation. And, and that's exactly what does not exist among the various sectarian heterodox uh, groups. Uh, so, again, Ecumenism can only flourish among those who don't have experience and are not following the church fathers. That's the only way you can you can you can purport uh, you can propose and promote such views, and you betray your lack of experience and understanding when you say such things. So, a living member of a living body—that's at the core of everything here. Nevertheless. Since the inception of the church, the theological thought of church writers has undertaken, among other things, to define, again, to, I think what here define is properly understood in this context is give boundaries to, right? Because that's what we do, what we, the term that's used in the ecumenical council is the oros, which means the definition of the council, the oros is actually the boundaries, so when we say define the essence of the church, obviously that's impossible, right? The essence of the church is, 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 is not even expressible in words, let alone definable. What he means is put the boundaries around that mystery, right? So that you outside of that, you will lose communion with that reality. And they want to understand, well, where do, where do I start losing communion? How do, why do these views that are, that are proposed by the various heretics, why are they both an expression of the lack of experience and leading people away from the experience? So they have to, in their struggle against heresy, that's when everything was developed, right? We didn't, we didn't start and speculate, you know, after the divine liturgy with coffee, let's speculate about what the church is. No, no, no. There was a, there was a struggle. There was a, an attack on the life of the church. There was an attack on the identity of the church. And they were responding. And in that response, they had to say, well, what, how are we going to express our experience? How are we going to show the boundaries outside of which you must not go if you're going to be an expresser and conveyor of that experience? Uh, and so they had to try to define the essence of the church and its properties in concepts comprehensible to the human mind. It was a, it was a pastoral endeavor, essentially. The brief definition of the church presented in its symbol of faith, we're talking about the creed of Nicaea, the first uh, and second ecumenical councils uh, creed, right? The Nicaean Constantinople creed, I believe in one God, all the way to the end. This, uh, this brief uh, uh, oros, the oros of the first ecumenical council was essentially the creed. That's what the definition, the decision, the boundaries that were laid down with it was the creed. And so the this attempt in the symbol of faith could not be sufficient to ward off the various heretical groups, since inevitable questions arose regarding the understanding of the credal, creedal definition itself. And the very church life of the church insistently demanded that these questions be answered. This also points to something very interesting. So, you know, in the fourth century, when we have the great and an unfortunate schism of the Monophysites who do not accept the Fourth Ecumenical Council and they depart. Do you know, obviously, that at this point, the whole church 
has embraced the, the Nicene Constantinople creed as it, as, so they had that in common. Of course, they had it in common at the Great Schism when the Pope of Rome walked away from the Orthodox Church and created his own sectarian uh, idea of what, what authority is and the Holy Spirit is and all the rest. They did not listen to the rest of the hierarchy. They understood then, they, they confessed up to that point, the common creed. It is harder to see with the Monophysites, but it should be very obvious to, for us to see with the Papal Protestants that the, the addition to that symbol is a proof of a departure from the symbol. It's a proof of the departure from the symbol. Because not only could they not understand and express that life uh, together, but now they actually change it to express something different. And they were they they insist on that change as uh, as blessed over and against all the church fathers and all of the ecumenical councils that had come before them and had rejected such an addition. What a tragedy! But you can see here that's not sufficient. We had those in common with all the various heretics from the fourth, fifth, sixth century all the way to our day. So more had to be given in order to protect people from the various uh, delusions and and to call the uh, various uh, heretics to. Uh, to, to repentance and, the, and to set down the boundaries. The life of each person and his outward actions is intimately linked to his self-identification. We have a crisis of identity today, don't we? I mean, everybody's wondering, uh, are they a boy or a girl? Or they're wondering who might be a boy or a girl. To that, to that, to that degree of loss of self-identification has, has mankind sunk. Uh, so, yes, uh, who are we? What's the point of this life? What's the meaning of this life? Basic questions. Likewise, the outward life of the church in many of its manifestations is determined by the church's understanding of itself. That is, by the dogma concerning the church. The questions that arose throughout history concerning church practice roused church theological thought to a more detailed clarification of the very concept of the church. The same was required by the distortion of the true understanding of the church wrought by heretics and systematics. The first centuries of Christianity are peculiar in that throughout them, the church frequently had to contend with errors that deviated from the truth, specifically in the doctrine concerning the church. Contrary to what people say today, oh, we didn't know about that. We don't have a definition. Unfortunately, important people say such nonsense. In the first century of the church life, we see se several fairly complex movements founded on ideas linked in one way or another to the dogma concerning the church. That is why more than at any other time, ecclesiastical theological thought in the first centuries focused its attention on clarifying the concept of the church. Again, contrary to what people often say today, that we didn't know, we didn't define, we didn't understand. St. Hilarion said, no, no, that's not true. It's actually then that it was laid down, but we're ignorant of it. That's why this book is so important. The heresies and schisms that appeared in the church merely spurred the fathers and teachers of the church, having received wisdom from God to set forth dogmas, which of old the fishermen set down in simple words through the power of the spirit and understanding. For thus it was fitting to acquire a simple exposition of our faith. So that's from the Feast of the Three Hierarchs on January 30th. Very important to understand here that this is the patristic way. We're not telling you anything new. We're simply taking the simple faith handed down and we're explaining it in a way that's going to keep us from falling into error of the various heret heretical threats that are facing the church today. So the essays here presented are therefore devoted to a study of of the pivotal points in the efforts of early church theological thought toward expounding and elucidating church doctrine concerning the church. The pivotal points, he's going to take the pivotal points and examine them. These pivotal points are determined by the most prominent anti-church movements founded on a distorted understanding of the church, with which the theologians of early church did literally do battle. Did literary battle, I should say. Sorry. These movements are Judaistic Christianity, Gnosticism, that would be the Judaizers, uh, actually, I think would be a better term uh, in our day. That's how we understand them. Montanism, Novationism, and Donatism, the various isms in the third, first, second, third, uh, and, well, up to the fourth century. 
and I guess St. Augustine would be the early, early fifth. Uh, so we therefore preface this study of the church's writers' dogmatic struggle against these anti-church phenomena with a brief, brief overview of the New Testament concerning the church. Each of the above phenomena in its own right could be the subject of a whole series of scholarly studies. Hence, in our essays, we will not be pursuing monographic exhaustiveness. So actually, that makes it more accessible to you and I, makes it more accessible for all of us. Rather, we are, will primarily focus on studying those dogmatic outcomes on the question of the church that resulted from dogmatic polemics motivated by one or another of the above phenomena. So we're, right, we're at the top of page 15 for those who are not uh, looking at the screen. In our essays, the ends in view will not be those of church history, but rather of the history of dogma. All right, so we're not going to be talking about church history generally. We're talking about the history of dogma. So we're looking at church fathers, church writers who are talking about the faith. All right? Only by thus limiting the task will it become possible to unite all the essays here presented into a single study. Since the most prominent anti-church movements of old, which we have noted, may only be combined from the standpoint of dogmatic history. Only if you do a history of dogma can you combine all this into one study. From the standpoint of the Christian teaching concerning the church that unfolded in the struggle to combat them. It is our author's view, in other words, he's talking about himself, St. Hilarion's view, that a study of various questions from the history of the dogma concerning the church is of vital importance to church life and the duty of church theological scholarship. Where's St. Hilarion today to talk to some of our contemporary academics who go on discussing and debating and dealing with things that are really not touching on the pastoral problems facing the church. The church fathers didn't write academic treatises for academic journals. They wrote in response to threats to salvation and the pastoral pimantiki, in other words, the pastoral, the bishop's concern for his flock. That's what St. Hilarion is talking about here and what should be going on in church life and in church scholarship. That's what it should be driven. It should be driven by these pastoral concerns. The question of the church is always an interesting and important question. One ought always to proceed from the concept of the church when resolving questions of church life. And frequently, these questions essentially comprise a repetition or modification of old ones. Again, he's saying, look, we have the answers. We need to reapply them. We need to go back to the sources. We need to answer them on the basis of the fathers. If we had two or three or even one St. Hilarion today, we would have a different reality in the church. We need this approach. Follow the Holy Fathers. The gates of hell, but down here in the middle of the page, the gates of hell arrayed against the church in the uprising of heresies and errors to this day give rise to numerous anti-church phenomena. Combating, he's talking about ecumenism here. He's talking about those things that are just are on the horizon, just appearing in, uh, in, in earnest in the Orthodox countries at the turn of the century there. Combating these phenomena is the task of the ecclesiastical figures of the day. That's the role of the bishops, to protect the flock, to, 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 to be on guard at the, at the entryway, to keep out the various heretical theories. It's not the job of the hierarchy. It's not the job of the theologians to go in dialogue with unrepentant heretics and other unrepentant heterodox sectarians. That's not the task, the role, the calling. That's a disaster. That's not what. We, that's not the way mission has ever been done. That's not the way the church has responded to heretical ideas in the past. That's not what's necessary. That's the role of church leadership to combat these phenomena. He says, combating these phenomena is the task of the ecclesiastical figures of the day. But this fight must be grounded in the ancient church, and linked to the treasury of the theological knowledge of the Catholic Church. That's exactly what he, he intends to do with this book. One cannot help but notice how in our time questions arise and are discussed that have long been quite sufficiently resolved by the writers of the ancient church. Nothing new under the sun. Go back to the sources and you have your answers. Who is not aware that the question of the church is the chief principal question in modern polemics with sectarianism in various forms? 
And of course, in conducting these polemics, one must always bear in mind the dogmatic conclusions reached by the theological thought of the ancient church. This is why a study on the history of the dogma concerning the church is able to meet the modern needs of church life. Again and again, he's telling us, that's why I'm doing this, because I love the church. And I, we need to answer to today's threats, and that's why this book is so important. Western scholars have long and extensively been engaged in scholarly research of the history of the dogma concerning church. Concerning the church. Catholics and predominantly Protestants, people who are strangers to the church. Let me repeat that. Western scholars have long and extensively been engaged in scholarly research of the history of the dogma concerning the church. And we know why, because they lost that experience. And obviously they're going to be grappling with that issue far more than we are in the East, in the Orthodox Church. And so they have a long history of grappling with this. The Orthodox are coming late. And that's exactly what happened. Again, I want to stress this was exactly what happened and has to this day been the norm in Orthodox engagement in ecumenism. We've accepted their paradigm, their presuppositions, their experience as the starting point and the context in which we then try to witness the orthodoxy, and it's a disaster. It's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to lead anywhere. They know it. Unfortunately, many of them know it, but they continue because, well, there are all kinds of passions that people have to have to satisfy. There are, and there is, of course, that rare, sincere, zealous cleric or theologian who's trying to do orthodox mission and witness in the midst of all that. I do not deny it. I do not doubt it, but that's not the norm. That's not the overarching uh, theme, let's say, among the Orthodox ecumenists. He says, these have been concerned with the dogma concerning the church for some time, the Catholics, in other words, the papal Protestants, and predominantly Protestants, the Reformed Protestants, people who are strangers to the church. Let me repeat that. People who are strangers to the church. He didn't say the church is partial, the church is a little bit here, a little bit there, we're all part of the church. He didn't say what they will say Eight years later in Constantinople, an encyclical to the various churches around the world of Christ, and talk about it as if the body of Christ in, involves and incorporates and includes all these various denominations, as the author of that encyclical said, which was a disaster. And then he quotes, for Alexei Komiakov, who they revered, by the way, contrary to some contemporary scholars, quite justifiably called Catholicism and Protestantism, heresies against the dogma of the essence of the church, against its faith in its own self. They've gotten to the point where they don't even believe the church is divine a human organism, just a human organism. And of course, if it's split into a thousand and ten thousand and forty thousand pieces, it can't be a divine human organism. And if it is, it's got to be invisible. Because, well, you can't talk about a visible body because obviously we're 30,000 pieces. And even in, even in papal Protestantism, you have an experiential and theological division in, in many, many parts of Catholicism. What does a charismatic Pentecostal liberation theology theologian in South America have to do with a union? Or, or, or a Cistercian monk who's studying the ancient text. What, what do they have in common except an authority figure that they appeal to? Otherwise, it might as well be two different religions. Uh, the conclusions drawn by scholarship outside the church is studying the history of the dogma concerning the church are what oblige theological scholars within the church to take up this important subject themselves. Why we love St. Hilarion so much? Because we understand and agree and embrace what he's saying here, it's our obligation. We people of the church believe and confess that we belong to that church which Christ and his holy apostles established. In the symbol of faith, we call our, our church apostolic. The history of the dogma concerning the church is, thus, is for us nothing less than the history of the academic and theological elucidation of the ever unified and unchanging concept of the church. Let's not be confused here. What we're doing is talking about the experience. It's not the experience itself, but we're describing the experience. Just like the Bible is not the logos to you, the word of God, but a witness and a and a testimony to that living logos, that 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 body of Christ on earth, right? Same thing here. 
The church and her self-identification have remained unified and unchanged from the time of Christ and the apostles to our own. So no matter what it might appear in this scholarly research, what might appear in all the various literature, this whole study that's been going on in the West and, and that I'm engaging here, this cannot and does not at all undermine or affect or distort or, or question the, that there's been a continuous experience and self-understanding that exists in the church by those who live the church. That's a given, right? I'm studying that now to elucidate it, but I'm not, I'm not making it. I'm not creating it, right? I'm just coming to, 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 to explain it and, and, and examine it. Our scholarly and theological elucidation of the dogma concerning the church has altered in its breadth and depth. Has altered. That's probably a typo here. Has altered in it. Has been altered, maybe. I think we got a typo. But scholarship outside the church takes an entirely different stance. And he cites now a text by a Protestant, famous Protestant, the rise of the old Catholic church. And what he means by old Catholic church is the ancient church. So this text is the title of a work by Albrecht Ritzel, who, which more than half a century hence laid the groundwork for the resolution of questions of church history and dogmatic history, which with certain am amendments is advanced to this day by adherents of this Ritzel, Ritzel school, prominent, pre predominantly in Protestant scholarship. So he really played a huge role in German Protestant scholarship. It actually affected a lot of I think Catholicism eventually. The very title of the work is highly typical. To the question, what is the origin of the ecumenical church? One who is within the church may answer concisely and definitively. Quote, the church has founded, was founded by our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and his holy apostles. If, however, entire exhaustive studies could be written on the origin of the church, it is apparent that the authors of these studies take a completely different view of the Catholic Church. And here he doesn't mean Catholicism. He means the Catholic Church, the one holy Catholic Apostolic Church. Similarly, titled Protestant works chronologically span over 200 years. Clearly, in the opinions of their authors, the church originated over the course of entire centuries. It originated, it developed. It wasn't given, developed in the view of these, uh, of these heterodox. Christ and the apostles did not establish the Catholic Church. If indeed they did establish any church at all, it was certainly not the one that later became known as the Catholic Church. Of course, the Protestant problem there is that their reference point is Catholicism, and that, of course, creates all the problems. The latter church originated on its own, on its own out of various elements, influenced by numerous conditions, and in the final analysis actually contradicts Christ and the apostles. He's talking about the heterodox view here that he's criticizing. It was not heretics and schismatics who distorted the concept of the church, but rather the church itself, they say, gradually altered its essence, retreating from its former self-identification. The, these are the sad, pathetic theories of men who have never experienced the church and are fighting against a straw man, a, against a distortion of the one holy Catholic apostolic church. That's the tragedy here. For many Protestant scholars, the ancient anti-church heretical movements we mentioned before are vestiges of the ancient concept of the church. Lord have mercy. As surmised based on scant and ambiguous information. Thus, it was not heretics who distorted the ancient doctrine concerning the church, but the church itself, which in condemning Montanism, for example, condemned and declared as heresy, something that was formerly ecclesial, its own doctrine concerning the church. You see how contemporary Protestants or the 19th century Protestants he's referring to are projecting <laughs> their own experience. Of course, they have to. That's where they're coming from. And we all do that, don't we? From our experience, we're projecting back on ancient church. And we're saying, well, here today we have a thousand sects and we're dealing with this sect called Catholicism. So we should question all of church history now and actually think about the sectarians of the third century as just expressions of the one church. How can such scholarship and such ideas ever find the truth and, and come to be united to the pillar and ground of, 
of truth, which is the church. What a tragedy. The church is Christ and his apostles envisioned it lasted for a very short time, according to these heterodox. By the second century, the Catholic church that had originated, in other words, was developing, declared it a heresy, destroyed it, and usurped its place. What a distortion of reality. What a distortion of reality. What was formed was not the apostolic church, but a church hostile to that of the apostles. In other words, the church of the fourth century, St. John Chrysostom, St. Basil the Great. These were, this was a church that was hostile to the true church, which had been lost, which was the, essentially the sectarians of the fourth century, third century, second century. It's amazing. There are people who actually speak in a, with, with a, you know, uh, uh, in all seriousness in such a way. Forerunners to the to the nihilist uh, of today. What a tragedy! Along with historical events in the life of the church, changes of the most radical kind were also taking place in the very concept of the church, according to these heterodox. For example, in the third century, a doctrine of the sanctity of the church was developed into a total contradiction to what had been said on the subject in the second century. Well, oof, it seems it would be not be an overstatement to say that this kind of idea of the history of the dogma concerning the church kills and undermines all faith in the church. It's not an, it's not an accident, brothers and sisters, that in the 21st century, people have lost faith in the church entirely in the West. I mean, I, I've been shocked, not totally, but it's still shocking that in these various um, reels that we've been posting, and, and one of them in particular has taken off it's over a hundred and something thousand views in, in a couple of weeks, which reels rarely are reels, you know, Orthodox reels get three, four, 10,000, but a hundred thousand. And it's on the seriousness of sexual sins. But what's my point here is that the commentary and underneath these is so anti-ecclesial because their whole reference point is a, is a uh, distortion of what the church is. And so they've rejected it and they've become cynical and they've become, uh, you know, just disgusted with what they understand Christianity to be, which is a distortion, unfortunately. Here, here is one of the, you know, the roots of this 19th century Protestant scholarship that, that undermined all faith in the church, which of course means all faith in Christ. You can't have true faith in Christ if you don't have faith in the church, because that's First of all, the body of Christ, but that's how we understand who Christ is. That's how we experience Christ. What a tragedy. If we agree with the Protestant exposition of the history of the dogma concerning the church, we must discard the ninth article of the symbol of faith, of course. If you're honest, if the Protestants are honest, they have to reject the Nicene Creed. They have to reject the ninth article. They have to reject the first ecumenical, second ecumenical, third ecumenical, all the ecumenical councils. They have to reject it all if they're honest, and they continue to maintain the various heretical ecclesiologies that are pushed within ecumenism. That article combines the Catholic Church with the Apostolic Church, one holy Catholic and apostolic. It's one church from the beginning to the end, the first and second comings of Christ. It is therefore the duty of theological scholarship within the church all of our academic theologians should be paying close attention. What's he going to say? It's our duty to give its own exposition of the history of the dogma concerning the church, which may be used to counter how that history is framed outside the church. That's what he's doing. That's why this book is so important for all of us in the English-speaking world. Here we have someone who's going to do this job for us. It's going to make it easy for us to go back to the ancient fathers and see that the church had a particular identity and a boundary. And outside that, there were no mysteries. And there, were no, there was no salvation. All, those, all the ones commemorated in this book, all the church fathers have that common conviction and, and, and experience. You walk away from the church, you walk away from Christ, and therefore salvation. That's the common witness of the first four centuries. And, of course, the whole 20th centuries, 20 centuries of the church but we're talking about the first four and the examination for this in this book to this day we might observe this duty remains almost entirely undischarged so he's he's complaining saying nobody's doing this 
And unfortunately, very few have done it since him. St. Eustin Popovich would be one of the great worthy uh, successors uh, to this, uh, this great saint. There have been works devoted to the history of the dogma concerning the church, but these have long become obsolete and do not at all consider the new questions that have arisen in the arena of scholar, scholarly knowledge over the last several decades. It, it is this circumstance that determines the nature of the present work on various questions pertaining to the history of the dogma concerning the church. We are preceded by scholars outside the church with whom we have a significant and fundamental difference of opinion. By the same token, there are a great many works dealing in one way or another with the history of the dogma concerning the church, since the history of the dogma concerning the church is intimately linked to the history of various aspects of church life and the teaching of various church writers concerning the church has its explanation in the historical circumstances of their lives and their ecclesiastical and literary work. For this reason, nearly every scholarly book on the history of the church or patristic theology has proven to have some bearing on certain questions, often minute and highly particular in our own study. Such an abundance of scholarly literature renders it us completely unable to systematically review all the opinions expressed on each of the multitudinous and very nearly innumerable questions in our study. <laughs> well, that's kind of funny because 2,400 references, he did a pretty good job, a pretty good job of getting uh, every every scholarly work and every patristic scholar, uh, work he had in mind, it seemed. If we were to undertake not to leave a single stated opinion without exposition and analysis, we would have to write an entire study on each separate question. Well, thank God we have this, we can have it it's accessible to us, even if it is long. Only by adopting a different approach can we combine an entire series of complex and intertwined questions of the greatest importance in a single, single study. We therefore choose the, appro to, the approach of historical criticism of the primary sources. Our attention will be concentrated, by the way, that's not the historical criticism of the biblical, it's not the biblical criticism that you're, you're, you might be having in mind. It's not the Western approach. Uh, he's just saying we're going to analyze historically the sources. Our attention will be concentrated primarily on remnants of early church literature, on essays by the writers of the ancient church who undertook to elucidate the teaching of the church. The multitudinous scholarly works we have studied served merely as our aids in achieving this stated goal. Nevertheless, we hold it impossible to completely pass over in silence all the variety and richness of the content of these uh, frequently monumental, informative, and interesting works and at times we will not be sparing with quotes and citations therefrom. You certainly were not, St. Hilarion, sparing with your quotations and citations. We merely do not undertake, uh, we merely do not undertake the complete and systematic usage. Each else we would constantly be obliged to stray far from the topic at hand. We will concentrate only on the most general ideas most frequently encountered among modern scholars of church history and dogmatic history. And holding the majority of these ideas inadmissible for theological scholarship within the church, in our study of the primary sources, along with the positive exposition. Uh, oh, let's see what happened here. There we go. Uh, explanation of their substance. We will point our facts within them to, that disprove or at least shake the foundations of Protestant scholarship's prevailing representation of the history of the dogma concerning the church. In other words, we're going to we're going to we're going to address those contemporary issues, uh, and we'll show uh, the foundations of Protestant scholarship's uh, history uh, representation of the history is mistaken. In our desire to discern the development of ecclesial self-identification in the writings and theological literature of the ancient church, in the course of our study, we may at times have erred from the truth by incorrectly conveying the thinking of the ancient church and passing off our own folly as church doctrine. Here he's doing what every humble study of the scholar of the fathers should do and, and is, is obliged to do and to say, look, look to the fathers. Don't mistake my mistakes for theirs. They're not to blame, but I am to blame. And that's what we're required to do. We can therefore do no better than to say in the words of the blessed Augustine, As many things as you have 
as you will have ascertained to be true, keep and bestow them to the Catholic Church. Those that you have received be false, spit out, spit them out, and forgive me who am a man. And let's remember that in our reading to this book, but also of St. Augustine and all the church fathers, uh, they are men and they can err. And that's why we don't become fanatic followers of one church father, but the whole patristic consensus together. Unfortunately, we have that in the church today. Uh, either they want to make a straw man out of church fathers, as I said earlier, and they want to present their opponents as being fanatical followers of one church father, which of course shows that they don't understand the patristic consensus properly. I think many times that shows that, but it also happens that we have fanatical followers of one or two church fathers. St. Augustine, I think that happens to occasionally, even among converts to orthodoxy, but especially among the heterodox. And so the same applies here uh, as everywhere that the patristic consensus, keep that, keep that. And, and there may be things in this book that is not the patristic consensus. It's not a perfect book. And, uh, 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 it's, it's, its value is not in its 100% perfection in every word or in every line or every take, but its love of the church fathers, its desire to present the Patricia consensus, and it's presenting to us the common mind of the church fathers. That's, I think, what we need to focus on when we're reading the book. The author holds all doubt as the perfect truth of the one holy Catholic Orthodox Church of Christ to be unacceptable. So there is no doubt in the perfection of the church, he says. Such doubt may, may result either from ignorance or from sinfulness. Laboring on the question of the church has taught the author to read the prayer for the church from the daily commemorations with particular love and trepidation of heart. Quote, Among the first, remember, O Lord, thy holy Catholic and apostolic church, which thou hast preserved by thy precious blood, to establish, strengthen, expand, increase, pacify, and keep her unconquerable by the gates of Hades. Calm the dissension of the churches. Quench the raging of the nations. Quickly destroy and uproot the rising of the her of heresy and bring them to naught by the power of thy Holy Spirit. September 25th. Oh, we're almost up to 110 years exactly here coming up next week from when he wrote this 110 years ago commemoration of the venerable sergius september 25th so that's a beautiful prayer that we can all adopt ourselves i hope we all consider to adopt that prayer for ourselves remember preserve quench the raging nations god knows that's happening quickly destroy and uproot the rising of heresy and that it reminds us of the, of the uh, prayer of St. Basil the Great in the Divine Liturgy, very similar to what St. Basil the Great offers. So hopefully, brothers and sisters, that's been an interesting and informative and exciting presentation tonight. I wanted to introduce the book to you. I wanted to show you why it's important that we read the book, why it's important that we read the writings of St. Hilarion. I wanted to acquaint you with those writings. I acquaint you with... Uh, uh, the man to a certain degree, but I think we all need to read much more. Uh, we are going, as I said, we are dedicated in our press or Uncommandant Press, along with St. Nicodemus the Hagrite and all the Kolivadi's fathers. We are pledging all of us in our team here and dedicated to take our resources and our time and continue to translate the works, if possible, the entire corpus of St. Hilarion Trotsky into English over in due time, along with the works and writings of St. Nicodemus the Hagiorite and all of the Kolivadi's fathers. And we're working right now on the translation, including a very important introduction by a, a, a very good scholar of the Kolivadi's fathers uh, down in Southern Greece of Do Dorotheos Vulismas' important treatise on baptism. And so that's another work that's going to be coming out from us soon. We're going to pick up soon the writings of St. Athanasius of Paros, very important uh, writer of the, among the Koli Fathers in the 18th century. Uh, but here tonight, we inaugurate 
our publishing activity with the most one of the most important texts that he ever produced, but certainly one of the earliest, if not the earliest, and that is his master's thesis, uh, an, an examination, an overview uh, of the various uh, of the dogma of the church in the writings of the church fathers in the first four centuries. All right, let's open it up to question, and we'll have a nice discussion before we uh, bid you uh, farewell once again. First question, and if you haven't submitted a question, I'm sorry to our uh, crowdcast um, um, brothers and sisters. We didn't have a connection there tonight. I don't know what happened. We just had some glitch. Uh, hopefully you can ask your questions here, and then we can always pick it up next week in our question and answer sessions on Thursday. Uh, so the first question. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, for pre He says, I pre-ordered the book. Well, thank you very much for pre-ordering the book. You can go to the website. Uh, let me actually put the link here for all of us. Uh, you can go to the website and you can pre-order the book. As I said, we're very close to having it in circulation. The first people who will have access to this book in the English-speaking world will be the conference attendees at next month's Uncut Mountain Press Um uh, conference in uh, in Pennsylvania, and uh, so that will be the book will be available, God willing. The book will be available. I said God willing because we're very late, but I think we're going to be able to make it. Uh, let me just uh, paste the link here. I mean, just basically go to uncommonpress.com. But uh, there's the link, uncommonpress.com overview of the dogma concerning the church. So thank you for the pre-order. And your question is, should I be reading anything else in preparation? Uh, and I think I've given you at the beginning of this podcast a number of texts online in order to prepare yourself. And I think it's very important. And I want to stress this. For all of you who are intending to go buy the book and read this book, it's very important. I'm going to say this three times. It's very important that you acquaint yourself with the man and his extent writings in English before you take up this book. Why? Because here you are not going to encounter the mature mind and writings of the saint, but his very first important master's thesis. I think it's, I think it's the first thing he ever published, to my knowledge. I might be wrong on that. We'll have to check. But certainly among the first. So I don't want you, first of all, to have any misunderstandings about the, about the saint. I want you to understand and know him and his brilliance. And those essays are going to point you to that very well, already existing in English. In fact, those essays are going to be a part of the corpus of all the uh, of the publication if we can if we can arrange that. That's my goal. Um, and uh, but you can acquire them uh, in you know PDF format right now. And I would especially stress that you read on the unity of the church and Christianity uh, or the church those two essays. Very important to read those and then to turn to this text and sit down and read it because he's not going to give us the brilliant analysis of the contemporary theories. That's not what you're going to get, get from this book. And I don't want you to walk away thinking, oh, St. Hilarion didn't have much to say about the big problems in the third century uh, or the debate between you know Pope Stephen and St. Cyprian or St. Augustine's uh, theories and things like that. He didn't have much to say. He doesn't have a lot to say in this text. He has a lot to say in his whole corpus, which we're going to eventually get to uh, bring to English. Uh, so you're going to this text because you want to begin where he began, and then you want to continue the journey with him, right? Uh, but you can you can jump ahead, and you can come back, and you can get, a, 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 I think, a more holistic view of what he has to say. And you're going to have access to so many quotes both um, from scholars of his day but most and from the saint, but most importantly, from the church fathers. And you're going to have the Latin and the Greek to, to consult because we've left that in the footnotes and we've translated the Greek and the Latin footnotes as well. So you're going to be able to see the, uh, the spin of the saint occasionally when he, when he comments. And you're going to see the Greek. You're going to see the translation. You're going to see the Latin. You're going to see the translation. And you're going to get a very good thorough grounding in the debate, the question, that was, and, the, and how the church faced all those ancient heretical movements. You're going to have a tremendous, in and of itself, walk away with a tremendous uh, array of arrows to, 
to shoot against the various heretical theories in your mind and in your community and in your in your uh, in your uh, surroundings, your friends. You're going to be able to present. Look, we've seen this before. We've seen this Gnostic idea before. We've seen this heretical. Uh, distorted view of ecclesiology before. We've heard the Judaizers before. We know how, how to answer that. Here, St. Hilarion shows us what St. Irenaeus says, what St. Cyprian says, what St. Ignatius says, right? It's going to be a tremendous aid in, in encountering the contemporary regurgitation of all these ancient uh, heretical ideas. Another question, how can Orthodoxy be one Holy Catholic and Apostolic when they are not in communion with each other so well to be the one now? Russians and Greeks at odds, no unity with the head churches. Okay, that's an interesting question, but it's a pretty straightforward answer. I don't think um, it, you, you need to worry too much about that. So if we go back to church history, we have many, many examples of schisms that happened Uh, between local churches that were healed. Uh, of course, we have those that were not healed, like the Great Schism when the Pope, after and his uh, and his uh, you know his yard and his followers and all the rest walked away and never came back. But before that, you had temporary schisms in the ninth century with Saint Photios, uh, the, the or rather from the Pope fighting against Saint Photios and the councils in Constantinople, and you had a breaking communion and you had. A return. Uh, you had that throughout the fourth, fifth, and sixth, and seventh centuries, uh, on a variety in a variety of times. Uh, so those that phenomenon is not new, and yet at the same time, no one doubts that in the midst of all those crises and struggles, the church was one, and the 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 holiness and the unity and the catholicity and the apostolicity of the church was never in doubt. So. What do, how do we explain the contemporary trials and tribulations? First of all, we have to observe that we don't have a schism of all the local Orthodox churches uh, with these two that are in schism between themselves. So Russia and, and the Patriarchate, not the Greek, but the Patriarchate. Right? Make a distinction. The Ecumenical Patriarchate is not the Greek Orthodox Church. Let me repeat that. The Ecumenical Patriarchate is not the Greek Orthodox Church. They're not Greeks. They're the ecumenical patriarchate. Greeks is a term, I guess, used that's very nebulous in, the, in, in terms of ecclesiastical identity in local churches because you have the patriarchate of Alexandria, which is Greek speaking, but you have many, many non-Greeks in it. So is it a Greek patriarchate? Well, it's Greek speaking and there's, there's uh, the whole heritage and history of the Greek speaking patristic history there from the fourth century on. So you could call it a Greek patriarchate, but that would be a, not representative of what's going on now uh, throughout the whole of the patriarchate when you have unknown, untold number of tribes and peoples and languages now being uh, catechized and incorporated into the life of the Church of Alexandria. Same thing with the Greek-speaking church in, in Jerusalem. Is that a Greek church? That's a patriarchate, ancient patriarchate. Uh, that is, for the most part, that the vast majority of faithful are not Greek speakers. They're actually Arabic speakers, and they're Palestinians. If you want to count up the number of people in that church, they're not, the vast majority of them are not Greek speakers. So is it a Greek-speaking patriarchate? Yes, and yet it's not a Greek patriarchate in the sense that you have a monolithic Greek identity, and Greeks and Greek speakers are are not, are not the majority. Anyway, you get my point. Patriarchate of Antioch, historically a Greek speaking patriarchate. Now uh, everything is in Arabic, and um, and uh, the people uh, identify themselves as Romans. Of course, they're Romi. Uh, that's if you ask them in Lebanon, what are you? You're Romans. We're Romans, right? That's the heritage that they have there, and yet they're not Greek speaking for the you know very few people. Uh, so anyway, the Ecumenical Patriarchate and the Patriarchate of Moscow uh, is in schism and over the whole question of Ukraine. And yet the local churches, to my knowledge, all the rest are in communion with both of them. So you have essentially a temporary division of brothers. You don't have the renting un as asunder of the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. And um, yeah, 
So that's how I'd answer that. I mean, we go on, but uh, that's how I'd answer that. If I have committed a grave sin and confessed to my priest, then beg for penance, but the priest says penance is not necessary, am I being disobedient if I don't commune for a period? I don't know. I'd have to know the penance. It's, 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 it could be. It might not be. You might have a case where your priest is not applying proper therapy. And, um, you know, penance, we don't, you know, penances are not punishments. Punishments. Penance means therapy. And you need to be healed. And the church fathers talk about that in the canons of the church. And they talk about healing the person. Go to St. John the Faster in the Exmulgatari, and he's talking about healing. And many of the things that he's asking them to do is not to be separate from Holy Communion, but to do fasting and, and strict fasting and prayer and prostrations. And that's how you're going to get healed from that sickness. And so are you being healed? Is, is the doctor giving you the medicine you need to be healed? If you went to a physical doctor and you said, uh, here's I got, and he sent you away and he said, you don't need to do anything, you're fine. But you still felt sick. Would you go to another doctor? Probably. Would you seek a second or third opinion about your impending surgery that he wants you to do, but you're not really feeling, uh, is he really giving me the right answer? Or the surgery he says you don't need, right? Would you go and say, you know, what do you think, doc? Do I need a surgery? And he might say, yeah, you need a surgery. We go to the church to be healed. The church is a hospital. The priest is a doctor of the soul. He needs to apply the medicine. I don't know what the medicine is in your case. He might be right. I don't know. He may be wrong. It depends. And it'll be based upon the patristic teachings about this particular sickness. Let's take the most common, and forgive my French, so to speak, forgive my immodesty, but it, let's, let's be honest that the vast majority of young men are... Uh, engaging in self-abuse and and are engaged in sexual practices which are extremely destructive to the soul. And are most priests applying the medicine? Or do we have people going again and again and again and walking away without proper medicine so that they don't go back in a month or two or three and say again the same sick, uh, uh, self-destructive uh distortive distortion of the human person, which is what those sexual practices are. Their extreme egotism, their extreme self-love to the nth degree. And the demons rejoice when people engage in those practices. And if you're not getting healed, go find a doctor who's going to heal you. Don't think that this, this, uh, the healing, uh, that comes through the prayer and the and the, the the prayer of the priest for remission of sins alone is 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 sufficient. If that were the case, there would be no canons and no penances ever talked about in church, in the in the in the church canons, right? In the church fathers, if it, if all you needed was to say the sin and receive the prayer, why all of the canons? Why all of the literature? Why all of the discussion in patristic literature about how to be healed of various diseases, spiritual diseases. People, people who are priests and have bought into the idea that they can throw the rudder into the uh, you know, back of the library and never look at it again because, well, I'm not going to hit people over the head with it. There's two extremes, folks. One is to hit people over the head with it. The other is to ignore it. Don't fall into those two extremes. Take the proper understanding, the orthodox understanding, take the, the wisdom of the fathers in the canons and apply them. That's what a, a good doctor does. He applies that which the church fathers have given us. The, the canons and the church fathers are not the problem. We are. We don't know how to be doctors. We don't know how to apply the ointment. We don't know. We've not been trained into healing the soul. And so we take all of this, this wisdom from all of the doctors that have gone before us, and we say, no, 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 that's, that's just for fanatical doctors. No, it's not. Apply the, 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 the healing. Read St. John the Faster's canons. Read the St. Nicodemus in the Exmo Ligatari. We, we sell the book on, our, in, on Combatant Press. You can get the, 
ebook version, unfortunately, the, the printed version is still to come out. We're still working on that uh, to republish it. But you can get the ebook version. Go to the canons that deal with these various sexual sins that many people are suffering from. And read what St. Nicodemus has to say and be liberated because it is it is it is so powerful. The excommunicatarian is so powerful in the message that anybody who wants to be healed is going to be extremely edified and be, 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 um, uh, what's the word I want to use? Catapulted ahead spiritually. So I don't know what to say. You may be correct. You may be in error. I don't know what the priest is telling you in terms of healing your soul of the particular passion that you are falling into. A sin you're falling into. Next question. Is there an Orthodox theology exposition you like, especially for new converts? Orthodox dogmatic theology by Father Michael Bomazansky, translated by Father Stephen Rose, or patristic theology by Father John Romanides? Question. Look, every contemporary dogmatic theologian today has something good to offer. They're not perfect. I'm not going to go to war against any of them. I'm not going to become a polemic against my father's. I'm not going to join the academic theologians and their and their smart aleck stances and say Pomazansky was was influenced by scholasticism or whatever they might say about Father Michael, the blessed uh, uh, priest and teacher of Jordanville. I'm not going to go after Father John Romanides and skewer him and say he's throw him out. He's a heretic. I'm not going to do that. What am I going to do? I'm going to seek out the patristic consensus in and through their works and the works of the church fathers. And there's plenty there. Be the bee. Be the bee. Go there and read. And you might say, well, I don't know what to say about this. Is he right or wrong? That's okay. You don't need to figure it all out in the first read. Read it. Have it in mind. Keep going. Keep reading. Go to the church fathers first and foremost. Use the patristic writings, the uh, academic writings today to aid you in getting to the church fathers. They do, the, they do do that. St. Hilarion was essentially in this book a, you know, for, in, in that context of the Moscow Academy at the day, he was essentially an academic theologian. That's what, is, what he's doing here. Is he's, he's doing the work of an academic theologian. He's going through a true orthodox academic theologian, which is, it has a role to play. I'm very negative toward academic theology today, not because in and of itself it's a problem. You can be, there are wonderful academic theologians today. My professor... Dimitri Chelenghidis is a phenomenal academic theologian. So was Dr. Manzaridis. So was Father Theodore Zisis. So was uh, Father John Romanides. They're not perfect. They have their problems. They have their errors. We all do. But so I, 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 I don't want to, you know, throw, throw the baby out with the bathwater. But what I want to say is their role is still to follow the Holy Fathers, to point us to the Holy Fathers. It's not... To, to, to innovate is not to, to pontificate, is not to speculate. And insofar as they are faithful in that role of, of connecting us to the Holy Fathers, they become, in, the, in their own way and to their own degree, followers of the Holy Fathers and links to the Holy Fathers. So I would say, yes, Father John Romanini's two-volume, let's see, got it right here, actually. I was looking at it for my, my uh, uh, lecture that I'm going to give in a few weeks. You've got two volumes here. Let's see if we can get it. Empirical Dogmatics of the Orthodox Catholic Church. And, but this is actually not by Father John Romanides per se. It contains a lot of his teachings. It's by Metropolitan Rothes Vlacos. And yes, you're going to find problems in there. I totally disagree with Father John Romanides on his question on his treatment of evolution. He doesn't get into it much at all. So that's the good news. But he's wrong. And Father Sarah from Rose is right. Okay. Kalomidus was wrong too. Kalomidus had a wonderful book against false union. Written in the 1960s, uh, the great Conteglu praised Kalomiros, all right, Alexander Kalomiros, but he was wrong on evolution, dead wrong, and tragically wrong. And yet he was very good on the question of ecumenism in his day, one of the first to write against the spirit of ecumenism in the 1960s. And again, the great Conteglu uh, praised him. So you've got to be the B, folks. You cannot say, I'm just going to go, I'm, I'm a Romanidian. No, you're not. You're deluded. If you're a Romanidian, I'm not a Romanidian. I'm not a Pomazanskian. I'm not a Yanaras. In I'm not a Zuzulian. None of that. I'm. I, we follow the Holy Fathers. 
So in English, I would recommend uh, to read Romanides. I would recommend, of course, the most important text in contemporary dogmatic theology. Unfortunately, not in English yet, but it should be soon, I hope. I hope I heard people were working on it. And that is, let me actually see if I can show it to you. What did I do with it? Well, it's over there. It's Dogmatic Theology by, Father, by St. Eustine Popovich. So anything you get from by St. Eustine Popovich is golden. And he's, he's, the, he's the number one uh, dogmatic theologian in the English-speaking language and in all the languages in, in the last 50 years. No, no question about it. And, of course, Father George Florovsky has tremendous things to offer. He did, he did err. We all do. He erred grievously on the question of uh, Augustinian thought and and the reception of converts, the whole katikonomia, the, the economy, krivia question. He's in he's in grave error, unfortunately, but he's tremendous in many many ways. He was a teacher of Romanides, Father Father George Florovsky, and he was revered by Saint Eustine Popovich. So that's the nature of things, right? There are few in each generation that are impeccable in everything, and the problem with many people today is they're they're talking and writing and assuming too much. You can't be an expert and write on everything and talk about everything. Choose your battles and go go deep in that and, and remain there, following strictly the Holy Fathers. Don't become a know-it-all, right? The more you go in terms of horizontal and you talk about everything, the more likely you're going to err. And that's something I need to listen to and hear because people want me to talk about all kinds of issues and want me to answer everything. And I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm going to make errors. I, it's impossible. I'm not, I, I, it's just humanly impossible to know everything about everything. Okay. So God forbid that we ever get to the point where we're, we're pontificating across the board. I think that's what happens. Father John Romanini has made a grave error on the question of the monophysites. I was told by the fathers in Athos and he repented of that error. He accepted that he was wrong. He never corrected it in his life because he reposed shortly after, thereafter. But Elder George of Gregorio and Father Luke told me personally the Romanides repented of that error concerning the Monophysites. I believe them. Unfortunately, he didn't correct it in, in print. So, um, you know, the church received Romanides. The church didn't reject him. He's not a heretic. He made errors. So did St. Augustine. We don't reject St. Augustine. Those people who throw out Romanides and trash him need to do the same thing with Augustine. And yet, I know they're reading him. They're going to him and they're reading him for his many wonderful texts, especially on the, his confessions. Father Seraphim Rose read Blessed Augustine and loved him. He didn't follow Blessed Augustine in his errors, and you don't need to follow Father John Romanides in his errors, but you can read him and be benefited from him and love him because he is the one who loved the Lord. You know, people said... He was one of the very, very few academic theologians in, in, in modern Greece that prayed, and it showed that he prayed the prayer, that he had a very vibrant spiritual life. You don't run into that much in the halls of academia, if ever. Doesn't show anyway, if you do. Next question. What objection do you have with St. Augustine's view that his theology of the relationship of the three persons of the Godhead has an Aristotelian philosophical root? I'm, I, I can't answer that tonight. There, there's one question I can't answer for you right now, and, and I'm not going to try. Next question. What do you think of Father Spiridon Bailey? I'm sorry. I hope you don't mind answering since it's an off subject. It is quite off subject, and I'm not going to speculate on other people. My brother in Christ, Father Spiridon, of course, everything I've seen by him, I've loved. I don't have any objections. I don't know what else to say, but that he uh, he and I are friends. We talk occasionally, and his work, uh, to what I can tell, is wonderful. Uh, very pious and very sincere, and following the Holy Fathers. But I'm not an expert. I haven't watched everything, so you know, take it take it for what it is. But I would say, yeah, it's it's, it's good stuff. Thank God. Who is chosen for salvation after Christ's coming? Who is chosen for salvation after Christ's coming? That's a strange question. Some priests say only the people of the Old Testament. You mean before Christ's coming then? And maybe that's what you mean. Priests say that it that it's only the people of the Old Testament. Okay. They say Christ makes it clear that on that 
to the Samaritan woman, despite the hour did not come yet. Is that true? One of the, those priests brought a rabbi to pre, present the Orthodox, for the Orthodox Christians to ask him about the Orthodox faith. Is that normal? Okay. Your question is a little hard for me to grasp because you say after Christ's coming, uh, but you probably mean before. Uh, so before Christ's coming, the people of God are very identifiable and they're the people of Israel. So when we talk about the, the, the equivalent of the church, the, 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 those who gather together as the people of God in the Old Testament, it's Israel. It's the prophets and all those. But obviously in Israel, you had tremendous apostasy. You had people who killed the prophets, didn't you? And you had all kinds of apostasy. So does that mean that they were all saved because they were Jews? No. And when, when they left this world without salvation, as the Apostle Paul clearly says, they, they, they needed to wait for the coming of the Messiah. And then when the Messiah departed into Hades and preached, well, first the, 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 uh, the forerunner went and preached the coming of the Messiah, and then the Messiah himself went, all those who wanted and embraced the truth of Christ were saved. So can we say that it was impossible for those who were not a part of the people of God before the first coming to be saved when they were given that opportunity with the preaching in Hades and the presence of the Lord in Hades. I think the general consensus is that, that before the first coming, those who sought and loved Christ, loved the truth in, in whatever way would have embraced him in Hades and would have been saved by him. After the first, after the coming of Christ, uh, again, identifiably, the people of God are the church, the body of Christ, those who, who he has, uh, through the mysteries, made his member, members of his body. That's a very clear identifiable, just like in the Old Testament, just like Christ himself when he walked on the face of the earth. It's very clear the boundaries. It's very clear who Christ is and where Christ is. One of the cockadoxies that unfortunately Orthodox have embraced in this day and age, which is a tragedy, is this bad application of something St. Irenaeus says. I talk about this in my book uh, on the ecclesiology of the Second Vatican Council and in my lecture series on ecclesiology. And that is this idea that they take this idea of the Holy Spirit being in all places and working and filling all things, of course, and that outside the church, the Holy Spirit is at work, of course, working to bring people to Christ, of course, uh, and they take this, this obvious truth and they say, well, therefore, we know where the church is, but we don't know where the church isn't because the Holy Spirit's working all throughout creation and people are embracing and following the Holy Spirit and therefore they're a part of the church. Well, this is very confused and problematic and not applicable. And it's a distortion of our ecclesiology and the truth of things. The Holy Spirit is definitely working outside the church but it's not working as it works in the church because the presuppositions are not fulfilled outside the church. And in the beginning of that is with initiation, with catechumenate and then initiation. Those two things have to come together, right? They're, 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 they're inseparable. The catechumenate leading to the initiation. That's when purification, elimination, and deification starts. And in that context, then we can talk about the body of Christ. So we know where the church is, the body of Christ, and we know where it's not. Of course we have to. Those two things have to go together. We know where Christ was. He was on the Mount of Olives. And we know where he was not. He was not there among uh, those members of his body who were denying him. He was not there. He had they had departed from him. He was not there. He was with his apostles. He was, he was on the Mount of Olives. Uh, does that mean the Holy, again, the Holy Spirit is not, no. But we know where Christ is and we know where he is not. So, to go back to your question, before Old Testament, we talked about that, the preaching in Hades. I would never bring a rabbi to teach anything to anybody in the church. Why? Because he's rejected the Messiah. <laughs> he's rejected the Messiah. He's like one of those in Hades who said, no, nah, I don't think so. I don't know you. He's like one of them who, 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 who said, crucify him, crucify him. What are we talking about here? Have we lost our mind? The, the rabbis post-Christ reject Christ. 
If you're a rabbi, you reject him. That's what it means to be a rabbi. You're in the you're you're part of those people, the Jewish people who did not receive the Messiah. You embrace a tradition. You embrace the the uh, essentially the Babylonian satanic mystery religion that, that they, they've 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 that's called the Kabbalah. Right? That's that's demonic. You embrace Zionism, perhaps that's demonic, right? The the the, the call for uh, the 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 uh, ascent of of the Jewish people to have a global hegemony and and the and the working now of the spirit of Antichrist to bring about the Antichrist. Are you serious? You're going to talk? These people are going to teach us about Christ and the Old Testament. This is extreme forms of ecumenism. Contemporary Judaism is not. The people of God in the days of Christ who embraced Christ, embraced the Messiah. That's not the people of God. That's not the chosen people. They don't even believe the same thing. There is change that transformed. The Masoretic text after 800 years is different. It's not the Old Testament text. It's not the Septuagint. It's not the same uh, tradition and, and experience. So I don't know what to say. I mean, Orthodox priests are people who are embracing such ideas. God help them. Question, has there been an attempt to hide St. Hilarion from general knowledge since he is not that well known? I don't know. I would say it's not a concerted attempt, but I would say people who could and should have been dealing and writing and translating him have not done that. They've dropped the ball. I mean, I don't know. I can't point to any fingers. I have no idea who that would be, but I think there should have been more people involved. We're just a little tiny press, and we've got a small budget. And we've, we've, you know, a lot of resources and a lot of time to bring this book to, 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 uh, to, the, to the people of God. Uh, there's a lot bigger presses that could have done this a long time ago. So I think you, you're hitting on something, but it's unknown to me any details. I, don't, I couldn't tell you any details, but it is very strange. And of course, that means that they're probably not feeling like they're, St. Hilarion is expressing them to a certain degree, right? Or there's others. Who, do, who love St. Hilarion, but they've not done their due diligence. But I do think there's a, too many academics in the Russian tradition who have turned their back on the tradition that he represents, the Kolivadis fathers of Russia, as I call it, St. Metropolitan Anthony, the Russian Church Abroad. There's obviously a number of academics in other places who don't identify with that. They don't like his teachings. They don't want the ecclesiology of the fathers that he represents. So that's going to end now. And English people are going to have access to listen and sit at his feet in yet another way, in a very systematic and 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 uh, important way. Another question from Bogdan. What should I do if I struggle with apparent inconsistency between the biblical narrative and the scientific observations? For example, the flood, especially because it was mentioned also by Christ. Well, I think there's plenty, and maybe you're not well informed. Maybe you need to turn to the many scientists who are showing that there is a lot of evidence pointing to the flood. And uh, I, I'm not well versed in this. This is not my forte. Again, as I said earlier, I can't deal with all issues and answer all questions. I'm just one person. And God forbid that I try to. But I do have people in my life who are very interested in this. And I know that they're finding a lot of scientific uh, evidence and scientists outside of the atheist circles that are showing that there's a lot of evidence, for instance, for the flood. So maybe the apparent inconsistency is because we're not reading the right sources. We're not opening our mind to them. We're not starting with the biblical narrative and then approaching the contemporary science. Maybe we have our, where we're starting, our starting point is off. Maybe our trust is not there. Maybe our, 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 our um, spiritual and academic milieu is not the right one. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I would point, I would go dial it back a little bit and get out of those circles that are telling you, uh, giving you supposed answers. You know, it's not just authority. Like just because someone believes doesn't mean they become a great scientist. I get that. But rejecting first principles, rejecting God, tells me you've got a nimkampu, and you're not going to get a lot 
of mileage out of him scientifically. Like you, when does that happen, right? Where does that happen? That people reject the creator and a, a creator, and yet they're going to answer more and more difficult, uh, more difficult and more minute questions, more important questions. Are there any more important questions? How can you come to the conclusion that this world has not been created by God? You've got to be a fool, as the scriptures say. So why would I sit at the feet of atheist scientists, even if they show themselves to be brilliant in a human way about observation of this created world, when they can't get the first principles right? You know, it, that's, that's something I've never understood. Why do we put our trust in men who can't get A, B, Cs? They don't understand. They can't speak English, and yet we're going to ask them to write a treatise or something. You know, they can't figure out where they came from. They don't know who they are. They haven't answered the question of life and the meaning of it. They suppose that things just one day blew up in the vast universe, this creation that is so marvelous and inexplicable and endless. It just came out of nowhere. I mean, who says such nonsense and you're going to sit at his feet? I don't know. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe. But I'm not, I'm not be able to get into details because I'm not a scientist and I'm not a theologian who's dealt extensively with uh, the question of creation and the, the various theories like Darwinism and all the rest. You know, I, it, for me, it's enough to read Father Zaire from Rose and um, and a few others, and and I'm I'm okay. I don't need to go deeper. I'm not troubled. Next question: If one church is out of communion with another church, what does it mean spiritually for a person to commune anyway? Can a layman switch jurisdictions at will, or do they need a blessing? All right. So, as we said in the contemporary situation, Orthodox churches all around the world are in communion with one another, except for that particular schism between Constantinople and Russia. I, I don't think there's, it's been spread beyond that. I know there are antagon, antagonisms and crises with the Patriarchate of Alexandria, for instance, in Russia. But I don't think we've got to the point where they've ceased com uh, communion with Russia. So it is still a main, a very contained problem. And I, God forbid that we go any further. But if there were developments in that realm and we had a open, massive split between local Orthodox churches, of course, you and I and everyone around the world would be faced with understanding and choosing which is maintaining the holy apostolic tradition, which is following the saints, and which is uh, faithful to the, to, the, to, the, to the fathers and to the apostles. We'd be faced with that. To a certain degree, we're already faced with it on an intellectual and a spiritual level. We all have to face this question, what's going on in Ukraine? Who has it, who's correct and who's doing what the Holy Fathers and the Lord, the Lord desires? And that they're following the Holy Fathers. I've said to you in the past, to me, it's pretty obvious that the Patriarchate of Constantinople is an error, grave error. And there's been treatises written why they're in error from Greek theologians like Father Anastasios Kotsopoulos or the Metropolitan in Cyprus, Nikiforos. And they've shown clearly that they have no basis to do what they did in Ukraine. And this is not coming from Russians, but from Greeks. Greeks. So Greek speakers, people in the, in the Church of Cyprus, for instance. Um because the whole term, I'm, anyway, I'm on a tangent, but the whole term Greek is problematic. These people around the world are Romans, Romi, Romi and they're Greek speakers. That's a difference than be Greeks, but that's another question anyway. Um, so I think that we need to come and say what's going on here. We need all of us to understand what's going on here, and we need to act accordingly uh, and, and work in our own little way to put an end to the schism and to put an end to the delusion uh, that's being promoted. Uh, and, and that this, this, uh, uh, these non-ordained uh, schismatic uh, figures in Ukraine uh, are not Orthodox bishops and should not be received as Orthodox bishops. And it's, it's a tremendous problem for those who have to, you know, are, are facing this and are, are following bishops who are teaching this. It's a tremendous problem for the church. Uh, but, 
<clears throat> that doesn't mean that at this point we have an ecumenical council that said that here's the boundaries. We haven't had a clear break throughout the Orthodox world. So I, I would say that none of the, there's no basis to say anywhere that there's graceless mysteries or, uh, you know, Mount Athos is, you know, since under Constantinople, because the hierarchy of Constantinople is in error about this, they're all graceless or something. None of that can be said. Nobody can say that. There's no authority on anybody to say that. And there's no reason to say that. There is reason to say, wait a minute, the, 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 the very deceitful methodology that's being carried out to solidify the schism and solidify the acceptance of these schismatics against the consensus of the most orthodox churches and against the patristic tradition and all the rest, that has to be countered. That has to be resisted. And it, it's not, it's, 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 it's impossible to be indifferent to that because it's a, it's like a cancer. And if we all just go about our business and are all indifferent, we're part of the problem. We've got to at least pray about it. We've got to at least be at, at pain of heart about it and, 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 and to work against it being furthered. Spiritually, you can commune in any local church. I don't see any implications at this point for that. I spoke to my mother's preacher, and he brought up in Matthew at the end, Jesus says to baptize in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that they are titles, not names. We say in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What's he talking about? So that's why they baptize in the name of Jesus. He also brought up Acts 2.38. I just want to know your thoughts. Well, this distinction, I don't know of it, it being anywhere in, in church fathers. And the, the question is, what does the church say for 2,000 years? What has the church done? Has the church gone around baptizing in the name of Jesus? No. Uh, there's a massive uh, study done uh, by a Protestant scholar right here. History, theology, and liturgy in the first five centuries, baptism in the early church. And they talk about this baptizing in the name of Jesus. And it's clear that the tradition and the, and the majority and of the, all the church was that they baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And there's three immersions with each name. That's what the church has taught and lived for 2,000 years. So whatever they say, whatever distinctions they make, it's irrelevant. Nobody asks them. Nobody cares what they say. What has the church said? What do the fathers say? That's what matters. Why would I care what a Protestant in the 21st century thinks? Why would anybody care what I think or you think in the 21st century? The, the question here is his take on it. Before we even get to whether it's right or wrong, why are you not following those who came before you? As all Christians have done for 2,000 years. Why would your take on it matter? Why do? We, that's what I don't understand about all these 30,000 Protestant sects. They have such self-trust. They're going to sit down and say, well, it's how I read it. It's how I understand the Bible. I think that's the way it should be. Who cares what you say? Nobody cares. You shouldn't care. <laughs> you know, why do we have such self-trust? What matters is what the saints have said for 2,000 years, the consensus, the patristic consensus, and what the church has done for 2,000 years. If you're ignorant of it, that's a problem. Stop being ignorant. Stop being ignorant of what they've, what they've taught and done. You can go back again and again throughout church history. It's a consistent practice. Baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit each time one immersion. Uh, I don't know. I can't you know go into the whole apologetics for that, but that's the practice, and that's the faith of the church for 2,000 years. Another question. Why are the different the differences between different parishes, priests in the Orthodox Church regarding the frequency of administration of the Eucharist, some weekly, some only during the four fasts? Thank you for that question, Bogdan. So it's a long answer. Um, there's a book that you need to read, and you can see and follow the patristic teaching and understand what the fathers teach. And that's where we have to start. We have to start with the patristic teaching, the patristic consensus. And that's why we love St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain, because what he did was mine the Holy Fathers and present them. And he went through in the Philogalia, in the Pedalion, and in this book called Concerning 
Holy Communion, the frequent communion in the Holy Mysteries. That's a book dedicated to why the church fathers teach that we should commune frequently. Now, having said that, of course, there are presuppositions for that. It's not, it's not oh, just go commune, obviously. So he's not saying that. And so some church fathers, if you're in the Romanian church, which I'm sure you are, your name is Romanian, and other churches in the older practice in Greece, which I think is more or less dead now, there was this idea that you have to prepare yourself extensively to commune. And you only commune four times a year. And anybody who communes more often is, is disdaining the Holy Communion, essentially, because they're not treating it with the deus, with the awe, with the preparation that is necessary. And that is not about numbers, not about frequency. It's about, you know, fasting and praying and, and, and preparing yourself. And so they would only commune on the mother of feast of the mother of God, Christmas, Pascha, maybe one more time, maybe apostles fast, but they'd have to fast for weeks beforehand. And that's it's hard to know exactly where this originated because it's not the patristic consensus, it's not the practice of the church fathers, it's not the practice of the saints. In the lives of the saints, we don't see that. We don't see them avoiding holy communion. That's not what well, our example. Uh, it's hard to know when it developed and how it developed, probably developed hundreds and hundreds of years ago, slowly over time, when there was uh, not a lot of uh, the people were not frequently taught or frequently confessed. So if you were in my village, uh, the, my village, meaning the village I was a priest in, in Greece for, for 10 years, uh, you would if you went back 100 years ago, 200 years ago, even 60 years ago, and and the people saw a confessor because in the Greek tradition or in the Orthodox tradition outside of probably Russia and some other local churches, uh, not every priest confesses. You have to have a blessing from the bishop to confess. And that was probably also a process, uh, something that happened over a long time because, of the because they were not educated during the Turkish period. And there were few who were spiritual fathers, few who were, you know, ascetics. And monastics who could take on that role. So what what happened in the village is that they would see a confessor four times a year. He wouldn't come more often. And so over time, people would say, "Well, I have to wait to confess, and then I'll commune." Right. So I think it just kind of organically developed over time that people did not have confession regularly because they did not have access to a confessor. And therefore, they did not commune regularly. And then they associated that because the confessors came out during those fasts, right? The confessors would come out in preparation for the big feast and confess them. So they thought, well, and the Russian church certainly has this teaching and practice that you have to confess before communion. And I think that probably, that probably was a fairly wide, widely practiced, uh, you know, practice very widely accepted in, you know, in the 18th, 19th and early 20th century. And it's not the case uh, for, for most Orthodox today, in the, in the Greek-speaking world at least. But um, so they so then that's, that's how that developed. And so over time, people not knowing exactly the teaching of the Holy Fathers, but seeing that this is what we were doing for, for you know, generations, they said, this is the way. You cannot commune more often, right? It went from, I can only commune because of these practical considerations these, these four times a year, now I cannot commune because that's not what we do, right? You see how that developed over time? And that, again, I think a lot of it today is from a pious stance. It's, a, it's out of piety, but it's, a, it's, a, it's probably a wrongly headed piety. Now, what's the other extreme? The other extreme is, well, we're seeing this in, in the Western world in America, you see this more often, people who truly are not prepared, not preparing themselves, not praying, not going deeper, not confessing regularly, but because they've been stressed from the bishops, from Father Alexander Schmemann, from St. Nicodemus's book, maybe, but probably more from their local priest in the OCA, the Antiochians and other places, uh, or just laxity, worldliness, you know, commune, doesn't matter. There's a variety of reasons why there's this other extreme now developing where people are communing all the time. Every Sunday I go to communion and you're like, well, really? Okay, what, when did you go to confession? Well, it's been months. Is there anything that's, you know, and then you can start to talk to me, you realize, well, wait a minute, you're, you shouldn't commune so often, actually, because you're not living the life 
that one should le- live to make that analogous like that. It's kind of goes together. The ascetic struggle, keeping of the commandments are presuppositions for a salvific communion, right? Those things go together. So when you put them together, you have frequent communion. When you take one of those away, access to co- confess and access to communion um, or a lack of ascetic life, then you then you run into problems. You probably, you probably shouldn't commune regularly, or you're communing regularly and you really you really have not prepared yourself. So you, the balance you've got to keep everything together and balance that. And and the goal is to commune frequently, but you've got to live the life that goes along with that frequent communion, which is going to be keeping all the fast. It's going to mean praying your prayers every day. Praying the pre-communion prayers every time, um, you've you got you've got to ha- live the analogous life. Now you don't need to become some great ascetic among athos to commune frequently. I don't think that's true. And Saint Nicodemus clearly says that's not the case. But you've got to you've got to have the blessing of your spiritual father, and you've got to be going to church regularly, fasting regularly, praying every day. That's the part that's. Our effort, our contribution, our good disposition that we take to communion with us. And then you're going to have a fruitful, energizing, so to speak, activation of the kingdom of God within. Those two things go together. Same thing with preparation for baptism. If you're a catechumen and you're not properly prepared, you're not properly initiated, you're not going through the purification process, throwing off the old man, trampling on the sins of the flesh, turning your back to the mentality of the world, turning away from the old man. If that's not happening, and yet you're going to be baptized next week, that's not right. you got to prepare yourself and be ready to embrace the life, not just theoretically the faith, right? Of course you've got to have the mind of Christ. Of course you got to accept and understand and, and agree to at least, maybe not understand, all of the dogmas and all the teachings that Christ revealed to us, of course, but that's not enough. you got to live the life, too. you got to be prepared to live the life. That's what the catechumen is going to do for you. It's not just read another book or two and then go to be baptized. That's a travesty. That's like saying to people, it doesn't matter if you fast on Wednesday and Friday. It doesn't matter if you pray much. It doesn't matter if you say the pre-communion prayers. Commune every Sunday. And there are people who say that. There are people who say, because in the divine liturgy, the priest says, with faith, fear of God, faith and love, draw near. It's like a commandment. You must draw near. You, if you're in divine liturgy, you must commune. There's people who actually say that's nonsensical. It's idiotic. It's like it's like a literal interpretation of the Bible. Like you just sit down and the Bible says, pluck your eye out. I must pluck my eye out. <laughs> just the divine liturgy says I have to commune. Oh, I have to commune. No, 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 no. That's presupposed. That priest is saying that because it's presupposed that you're doing all that in order to commune. All right. So I think I've presented you that there's two extremes. The royal path is 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 the goal of frequent communion with proper preparation and frequent confession. So you you up the ante of the ascetic life. You go to communion free, more frequently. That's how it works. You are worldly and, and and indifferent, and you don't struggle. Don't go to communion that often because you're not gonna you're not gonna approach with the fear of God and with faith and love. You're not gonna have that. It's not a, it's not just desiring it. You've got to live it to make it real, right? And they have those virtues. What do you think about seminaries only accepting people with high school certificates? I mean, universities nowadays are not even really forming properly educated men, but poisoning them. So why? Well, it depends what the seminary is. If you go to if you go to Jordanville, the Holy Trinity Seminary, the bachelor's degree is an undergraduate degree. You can get into seminary with a high school diploma. As long as you're living the faith and you have a blessing spiritual father, you can start attending the school in uh, Holy Trinity Seminary in Jordanville, New York. So that's a bachelor's degree. I think I think uh, uh, that 
uh, exist also? I'm not sure. Is it, does it still exist at St. Tecons? They still offer bachelors? I don't know. But so there might be a couple places in the United States where you could actually go right out of high school. As far as the other ones, like St. Vladimir's, Holy Cross, I'm not sure, St. Savas, I think St. Savas is also a bachelor's, but let's just take those two. Um, it is problematic if, if, if you're basically sending people into the gulags of higher education today, which is many, many universities, which means you go to party, you go to live a, 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 a debauched life, and that's what a lot of people do on that campus. And so you're putting yourself in a very difficult position and situation that you have to live like a hermit and you have to find, you know, the, like a needle in a haystack. You've got to find those other three, five Orthodox Christians to, you know, and it's possible. And there are places that are still doing it. People are still doing it. But I agree to you. I agree with you that it's it's problematic that we seem to be forcing or, or assuming our children have to go through that if they're going to be acceptable not only at seminary, but just generally, right? There are there are students, there are children, you know, who shouldn't go to college. Should not. Like even if they have an opportunity, they shouldn't go. Now, who are those that requires a lot of discernment? But there are young men who who should be workers. That's what they're made. That's what they're made for, right? And we're all we're trying to make everybody fit into this 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 one box, and it's a disaster. So I agree with you, but. Having said that, those places offer master's degrees, and they're required to demand from you an undergraduate degree. So you don't want that? You don't have that? Go to the other seminaries that are bachelors. It's a practical question. I don't know if they're ever going to change that because they're focused on high education. That's what those schools are about. So I doubt they're going to change that, that prerequisite. But it is a good question, I think. Jehovah's Witnesses believe, this is another question from Hamera TV, that Jesus is, was separate from the Father and not God in the flesh on earth. What is the proper Orthodox view of the relationship between Jesus and God the Father? As we say in our lessons on Revelation, uh, following the great elder Athanasios, Jehovah's Witnesses are blind reading blind men reading the scriptures everywhere and all places throughout the new testament the words used to describe the incarnate logos jesus christ apply to god and god alone and therefore we're talking about god incarnate they don't understand the scriptures they don't understand and follow the holy fathers they make grave errors and they end up unfortunately, with the lot of Arius, who's been anathematized and is unfortunately far from Jesus Christ and salvation, according to the witness of the church fathers and others who've seen the other world and see those who are far from the grace of God or reject the grace of God. If you reject the divine humanity of Jesus Christ, you walk away from salvation and nothing makes sense. None of it makes sense. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the divine human person. The logos of God has been incarnate in man, and that is Jesus Christ. The relationship between Jesus and the Father is the relationship between a father and a son. He's the son of man and the son of God, one at the same time. He sits now at the right hand of God the Father in with that flesh. Jesus Christ sits there. This is one of the reasons why we have to reject perennialism and every perennialist theory. Because the person who sits at the right hand of the God the Father is Jesus Christ, the incarnate logos, right? The one who walked on this earth, the very flesh. So when they talk about the logos being the one who, who, who is working throughout the religions to this day, supposedly working salvation throughout the various religions, they separate the logos from Jesus Christ, the one who sits at the right hand of the Father. And it's just nonsensical. They, they, they have him at war with one another because obviously Jesus Christ did not preach. The incarnate logos did not preach. There was any other salvation except through him. 
He didn't say that the logos didn't say that. Jesus Christ said that. Anyway, I'm getting off topic, but I, it is such a tragedy what what's happened to people like the Jehovah's Witnesses when they have been led astray by the devil and the demons themselves to reject the divine humanity, which screams from the pages of the New Testament. Uh, maybe we need to do a podcast on this in the future, and we'll go in depth about the rejection of Arianism, which applies to Jehovah's Witnesses. I've never really sat down and done much study of what they believe. I'm going on what Elder Athanasius uh, has taught. So we'll probably have to revisit that. Uh, despite their ecclesial separation, uh, this is Colin Justin Grimmond. I view both the non Chalcedonians and the GOC old calendarists as closer to the church and its ethos than Western Christianity, your opinion. Absolutely no question about it. In terms of their ethos, there's no question about that. Um, however, having said that, <clears throat> We're in dangerous territory in one respect, and that is that true orthodox ethos is inseparable from the dogma. And so we're talking about something that, like Christ himself, it exists incarnate in the body. And you can't talk about it autonomously. If it, you're talking about it holistically. So what is possessed by those who've departed from the communion of the church? And now we're talking about non chalcedonians for 1,500 years. What's possessed cannot be the Orthodox ethos in, 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 in its, I don't want to say in, in its entirety, because it's not a quantitatively, you can't quantitatively speak about it like that. You can't, you can't speak about it in portions or in, 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 in with numbers. Because it's it's the person of Christ, it's the it's the life of Christ, and that can't be separated from the dogma, and it can't be separated from the body. So we see the fruits of that life very intensely in those who are closest to the life of the church. Just like you in Greece, if you go to Greece today and you go among people who don't go to church often, and maybe even people who don't even believe in Jesus Christ anymore, but they're they're unbeknownst to themselves. They're living off the dregs, or the not, maybe the dregs is not the word, but the, the the ascetic struggle and the piety of their forefathers, whether they like it or not, whether they know it or not. And so you run into people who have that orthodox philotimo, that ethos, or at least the effects of it in their life, because I don't want to divide it up and make it something quantifiable like that. It, that, that that's a problem. Um, when we talk about it like that, because then you can have, you can you can talk about partial communion, and you can mean that we're actually communing in the mystery of the church in 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 you know percentages, but that's exactly the heresy preached by Second Vatican Council, which the Orthodox must reject. It's an innovation and not the patristic ecclesiology, uh, but it's undeniable that the that they're they're living off of that treasure even if they themselves do not have it holistically as such. Big old calendars are a different story. I wouldn't put them in the same bag with the non chalcedonians I don't think that's, I mean, look, we're talking about a schism that's very much healable. It's very new. And um, in many ways that we have holy men who lived in the 20th century, uh, like Elder Hieronymus of Egina, or, uh, you know, um, Others who were very zealous to defend the church calendar. Uh, so I wouldn't put those two together in the same category. I think there's, and anytime we do that, we're going to make mistakes, right? Uh, th that schism needs to be healed. And it's going to be healed, I believe, in part. I don't think all, the, all of it will be healed. I think, unfortunately, there will be a portion that will continue no matter what happens. No matter if, if humanism is condemned in council, there will be a portion of the Greek old calendars who will never unite again, unite themselves to the Orthodox, and that's a tragedy. But I think there will be a healing. There will be there will be an overcoming of the heresy. It's not it's not possible for there to be a mission to the world before the end, and there will be, if that is not overcome, there will be an Orthodox council. There will be a cleansing of the church. There will be a new crew in the church, 
and the contemporary heretical hierarchs will be uh, shamed by the by by their uh, by Orthodox bishops in due time. And when that happens, the struggling pious among uh, those separated by the by the uh, schism of the old calendar, you know, old calendar schism, they'll be they'll be united. I think, and and I think that'll be a wonderful day. I don't know how many. I don't, I don't, who knows? God knows. So I think that that's a much, you know, much different than the thousand five hundred year schism of the new of the nine Chalcedonians, which, you know, let's learn a history, folks. They tried to heal that again and again and again for hundreds of years. Saints have tried to bring that about, and again and again, it's been a shipwreck. And if we believe that. Holy Spirit guides the Holy Councils. We believe the Holy Spirit guides the church. We believe, we believe that God is, is the God of history and he controls all of history. Is it possible for us to turn back? The church fathers like St. Maximus, St. John Damascus, and all these other church fathers who've written and dealt with this over time, St. Sophronios or whoever, and to say, well, they didn't get it. They didn't get it. It's the Fourth Ecumenical Council, they didn't get it. We need to overlook all their work and the attempts and all that and, and realize that God was some I don't know where God was, but he wasn't there in, in Chalcedon. He, they didn't get it. They weren't God illumined. It's impossible to say that. It's undermining all of our faith in the body of Christ. It's 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 just it's just nonsensical. So we're talking about a, a thousand five hundred year schism that I you know there are many wonderful things, but we can't talk about the body of Christ in pieces. It's not possible to talk about the body of Christ in pieces. And that includes the dogma and the ethos because they're inseparable from the person of Christ. Ultimately, we can talk about it in a, as they say in Greek, katakristika, we can use the term, right? We can use it and abuse the term for, for in a way to describe what we experience and see. But we have to be very careful of the implications of that. I think I've said it pretty well when I started to answer this question. I'm not gonna, I don't wanna make it worse. All right, next question. Go ye therefore and teach all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Yes. Oh, it's a follow-up to the previous question by the Protestant. The pastor points out that the word name is singular because it's the persons of the Trinity. Yes, so he says he doesn't go to that pastor's church, but try and understand. Gave okay. Oh, I see. Okay, so yes, they're they're names though. They're singular names of the three persons of the Holy Trinity. What what's the what's the problem? We believe in the th three persons of the Trinity. Is he trying to figure out the mystery of the Trinity or something? I'm not sure what, what his problem is. It says baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each, per, each of them has a name, and the, collectively they have the name of the Holy Trinity. Both and. It's both and, right? That's what we do in Orthodoxy. It's not one or the other. They each have a name, and the name of all of them together is the name of the Holy Trinity. It's a mystery. He just needs to accept it. He just needs to accept it. He doesn't need to analyze it and then innovate. Just accept that that's what we're supposed to do. In baptizing the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's what we do. That's what we do, and we've done it for 2,000 years. And we immerse three times with each name. The one Holy Trinity, the one name of God. Three persons, one name. Anyway, all right. I think that's the end. I don't see any other questions. It's been a wonderful evening. If we didn't have the problem with Crowdcast, it would have been perfect in terms of uh, our technology. But we are going on three hours. You've been a great, attentive crowd. I can tell by the questions. And you've stuck with us, for most of you, for three hours. Wonderful. Thank God. I hope you'll run to St. Hilarion as a trusted and true teacher of the Holy Fathers and a presenter. Read all of his corpus and pray for us as we struggle to bring it all into English to help the people stay away from the delusions and the heresies and the schisms and all the, all the rest through the prayers of the great higher martyr who gave his life for Christ through asceticism, through teaching, and then with his own uh, suffering. So through the prayers of our Holy Father, and teacher, may we all make progress. May we all make progress and reach 
the heavenly kingdom. Good night. Oh,